let it be, be reflected on the record that is uh, 310 at the moment. And uh, we're going to have a long agenda, uh, hearing uh, legacy uh, bills, bill for legacy. Com uh, part of one, one, one part of uh, our community is legacy, and that involves arts and culture and heritage fund. So um, we have a long agenda, but we're trying to make it fun because this is uh, the facet of our state is through arts and culture. And uh, you'll learn a lot from hearing in our you know, fast-paced testimony today, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's a eclectic of um, what made up a Minnesota. So uh, due to the sake of time, and you know, our first author here has to leave on to, to an important meeting, I'd like to change the agenda a little bit and give uh, uh, Senator Champion a go ahead on his bill, uh, one of the most punctual senator of all, our president too of the Senate. So uh, we're going to go go over the timing agenda too. Um, we're going to time each senator and their project uh, based on five minutes, uh, and you will see a card presented by uh, our clerk here. Why don't you show those? So there will be a four minute card as the time draw by, and then a one minute card. And then how many minutes do we have for Q&A? Uh, two, two, three minutes. Two, three minutes after that. Okay. So, Senator Champion, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the committee. I'm going to be quick here, or expeditious. Before you is Senate File uh, 368, which is for the Minnesota African American Heritage Museum and Gallery. The Minnesota African American Heritage Museum, Museum and Gallery is the only African American museum in the state. Their mission is to preserve, document, and celebrate the achievements, contributions, and experiences of African Americans in Minnesota. The mission is carried out through exhibits and programs that educate and inform the public about history, art, and the culture of African Americans in Minnesota. The museum also offers critical services of black history, culture, art, and education. It fills a void as black history is not adequately taught in the schools, but instead, but instead marginalized to a few facts related to slavery. Dr. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, and even though these folks and those events are important, we know that there's such a long history. And to deal with the serious issues of systemic racism, black history cannot be relegated to one month, but must be included in all historical narratives as black history is American history. So the museum strives to elevate back black voices that are often omitted, silenced, or diminished. And to give some testimony is Ms. Coventry uh, Collins, uh, um, who is the co-founder and museum operator and director. So if you'll welcome her to the committee, Mr. Chair, she will present her very brief testimony. Well, welcome, and please state your name for the record. Thank you uh, to the chair and uh, committee. I'm going to add on to what Senator Champion has just um, presented. Since its opening in 2018, the museum has displayed over 20 exhibits. Uh, this year, we are opening our newest history exhibit, Black Liberation in Minnesota, which goes from 1800 to about 1960. Uh, we are also exhibiting uh, art, the community, quilt project. We have youth programs for teens 14 to 18, youth curator program, visionary Pro voices program, which introduce teens to curating, research, writing, um, photography, other areas such as spoken word, public speaking, and at the end of the program or summer, their pro projects are exhibited in the museum. We also conduct tours for schools, corporations, and organizations. Um, we've had visitors from as far away as Australia, um, England, Montana, and Victoria, Minnesota. Um, funding is needed to continue presenting programs and exhibits and will be used for oral, a oral history project on COVID-19 and its impact on the black community. Continue our arts in residence history fellowship program, develop a curriculum for K-12 for our un, 
breakable exhibit which starts in 1800 continue and expand our youth programs and general operations. Um, just to end, the museum is not just a museum, it's a gathering place where people come and learn about themselves. And we hope that uh, that's the same value that all of us have in terms of it, it, building our museum Thank you. over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Cohen, uh, for your testimony. And uh, we do concur that, you know, as in, in arts and culture, museum, or in anything, we, we concur that it brings people together. So, uh, members, any questions to uh, Senator Champion or to Ms. Cohen on the uh, uh, legislation or, or, or the organization? Okay, and Senator Champion, any closing remark? The closing remarks that I'll just say that it's a wonderful museum. It, it, it is a statewide asset. Many different people come uh, in order to uh, learn and grow and be inspired. Uh, Mr. Chair, I also want to say that the appropriation that we're asking for, we would hope that would be your floor and not necessarily your ceiling. So if you want to give us a little more money, we'll certainly take it, and we thank you for considering that. So thank you so very much. I appreciate Senator Champion for that ask, and I, I will look into that. And, and thank you for starting off this committee. Uh, who knew other than Senator Bobby or Champion to lead off and make us punctual and keep, right. keep us on time. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. And next on our agenda is Senator uh, Kunish, uh, Senator Fowl, 1916. And also, after you, you may go ahead and introduce your guest to one of our well-known uh, extinguished guests in our state. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have before you Senate File 1916. It is um, to uh, fund a new museum. Guinea. Um, it's a museum and cultural center of the north. This bill provides funding um, the, for the Museum and Cultural Center of the North. The Cultural Center will provide programming and educational efforts to teach the public about the history and the cultural heritage of indigenous people in Minnesota. Yeah, um, we are, this is a community-based organization from the White Earth Reservation doing regional work to address cultural and ecological sustainability for this region. Um, Akeen purchased the former Carnegie Library. Uh, it's a very, if you're familiar with Carnegie Libraries, um, these are historic libraries. These are historic buildings that we never want to go away. And so they purchased this Carnegie Library in Park Rapids, and the library will be converted into this new museum. Um, it's important to remember that the Carnegie family became rich when the so-called mining treaties were signed in 1800s, and this took the land away from the Anishinaabe. The Carnegie Library was built on native land, and it's time that we put it back in the hands of our native people. Um, I have here with me uh, Winona LaDuke. She'll speak more on this, but um, how do we say it? Giwena. Giwena means homecoming. Um, if you think about the experience of Native people growing up or as students, we experience our stories as, as relics. And I mean, I grew up like that, learning about my, my um, Dakota, Lakota heritage, but also our Ojibwe here in Minnesota. Um, we hear our stories as relics in a museum or almost complete erasure in just a number of ways. There aren't a lot of museums that are dedicated to indigenous people, led by indigenous people, um, and especially here in Minnesota, the original lands of the Dakota and the Anishinaabe. 
So by supporting the creation of this museum, it gives Minnesota and the indigenous people one more place to celebrate the many contributions our ancestors and our people today make to our land, and one more place where we create our own narratives. Minnesotans will have the opportunity to better understand the original people of this land while giving a louder voice to the Anishinaabe people who live, work, and practice the way of their ancestors in northern Minnesota and have for centuries. Preserving and educating one's cultural heritage ensures the heritage will survive for future organizations. And so with that, I have uh, Winona LaDuc, who is an international Anishinaabe leader who, along with others in the White Earth region, has led the efforts to create this museum. And so, Mr. Chair, I give you um, Winona LaDuc. Welcome, Ms. LaDuc. And our, our protocol here asks testify to state your name for the record, so please do stake oh, thank your name you. for the record. Thank uh, you. Anin Nindoe Magadintuk, Kaz, Makwa Ndodeam. My name is uh, Thunderbird Woman, and it's Winona LaDuke, and I'm Anishinaabe from the White Earth Reservation and enrolled tribal member. Um, I'm very happy to be w here with you today. It's really a dream for our community to have a place that's a museum to tell our history. And uh, Park Rapids is one of the many places that had a Carnegie Library. Andrew Carnegie made his money on the Iron Range, which is our territory. And in the 1855 and the 1837 treaty territories, uh, Andrew Carnegie, the richest man in the world in 1902, decided that he would no longer be a mining magnet and instead he would build libraries. 2,500 of them, a number of them are in Minnesota and I'm a product of a Carnegie library. I spent all my life as a young kid in the library. And so this, this Park Rapids has this library which has not been a library for many years. And I saw this, and for many years I said, this could be a place where people could learn about our Anishinaabe people. Because a lot of people would like to know about Anishinaabe people, and there's not a place to go in the north. Park Rapids is a tourist town. It is also a town that a lot of people, it is, it is surrounded by reservation territories. And so um, our intention is to bring forth this Treaty Rights Museum. We purchased it with private money. We've had private support for our work, and so we're not asking the legislature to give us the whole thing. We're saying it'd be great if you guys would cowboy up in the language of the North and give a little bit to help us educate our, our community, Native and non-Native people, about the treaties. Our first focus is the 1855 Treaty, which is the least known treaty really in Minnesota, but that encompasses a good portion of the North Country. We intend to see the boundaries part, you know, uh, posted, hoping the Department of Transportation does that, but more, what is, what, what is the treaty territory? What was it like here in 1855? You could drink the water from every creek and river. There was a buffalo herd in the western portion of the, of the state. There was wild rice in abundance. And Anishinaabe people were the people who fed the Minnesota people because we were the people with the land and who could farm. You know, that's a really important part of our history. Treaties were created and reservations were created under that. Leech Lake Reservation, Pokegama, Rice Lake, Gull Lake. You know, all of those were created and no, no people do not know about these, this history of this region. In the meantime, Anishinaabe people continue to live in the north, and there are a lot of opportunities in the school districts that are, they have no place to go to teach people about Native history, not only the history, but the present life of Native people, and how we exercise our treaty rights through hunting and fishing in the 1855 territory and, and uh, with our wild ricing. So we opened them, we purchased the museum in October of last year. We had our first party which was a Day of the Dead celebration. Uh, we had about, I don't know, 400 people. Uh, Mexican American community brought up a bunch of people. We had a grant. It was like the, this minute in Park Rapids where the multiculturalism of the North was apparent. Such great attendance. It was like a block party. It was a block party. We had ponies and marigolds and all kind of stuff. And, and since then, people have asked if they could have events there. So we had a, a Shell River meeting on the history of the Shell River. So we see it as a place that is really a native place to tell our stories and our history and to have feasts and to have events, but also a place where people can come in and have the space that you have in a museum to learn safely about history and culture. Also resource materials, because a lot of the scholars or young native people and older people, there are copies of many historical documents, but they are not up north. And so this would be a place where there would be a repository where people could go look at not only treaty documents, but many documents that scholars are, are interested in. And uh, 
So we see this as a place to have a wellspring for uh, knowledge and for reaffirmation of, of Native people in the North. Um, so we're very hopeful that you will look at this you know, appropriation for us. It'll help us move along and, and formalize getting some um, museum director. We, we had someone come in and already do some redesigning, took out a couple of walls. Uh, we're looking forward to you know, purchasing uh, uh, more materials for the museum, but really have had so much interest. We submitted a bunch of letters, uh, Park Rapids Business Association, White Earth Tribal Council, uh, many community groups said, let's just please make this. So I'm here saying that, that we would really like to have this museum and we're grateful to have this hearing with you here. Thank you, Ms. Ladogan. Um, I'm a person that always intrigued of language, you know, although I grew up being speech impediment, so I always had the urge, so one of these days I'm going to try to learn how to say your name in your native language. I know it's very long when you introduce your name there, but thank you for your presentation. Any questions from, from members? Okay, Senator Kunish, any closing remark? Thank you so much, um, Mr. Chair and members, for hearing and listening to this. And I urge you to support this bill that will provide appropriation for this new center. Um, will honor, inform, educate um, about the Anishinaabe culture, history, and their rights. Thank you so much. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And miigwech to both of you as well. Um, we'll lay over Senate File 16, uh, 1916 for possible exclusion. Also earlier, we kind of moved a little fast, so we also going to lay over Senator Champion's bill, uh, Senate File 368, for possible inclusion in, in the legacy bill. Next on our agenda is uh, Senate File 25, 2546. Senator Mann, welcome. Hello, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today to present Senate File 2546. Um, and it's a very exciting a legacy arts proposal from Clues, the state's yep. largest Latino-led nonprofit. For over 40 years, Clues has fostered community wellness and economic prosperity in the Twin Cities metro and more recently in greater Minnesota. Key to this mission is supporting local Latino artists and promoting cultural heritage. Clues accomplishes the uh, accomplishes this through arts education workshops, community festival, gallery exhibits, and artist apprenticeship programs. A legacy fund appropriation would help Clues expand this transformational programming and keep up uh, with the growing community demands in the Twin Cities and in greater Minnesota. With that, Mr. Chair, I have two wonderful testifiers with me today. <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome to both. Uh, please state your name for the record, even though I know both of you, but do <laughs> state your name for the record. Thank you so much. Uh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, yeah. members of the committee. Uh, I want to start by thanking Senator Mann for her support in authoring our bill. Um, my name is Ruby Lee. I am president of CLUS, Comunidades Latinas Unidas en Servicio. CLUS, as stated, is the largest Latino-led organization founded 42 years ago with offices in St. Paul, Minneapolis, Wilmer, Austin, and 140 team members who deliver services to over 30,000 people per year. CLUE's mission is centered on advancing social and economic equity and well-being for Latinos. Our multi-generational and holistic services focus on advancing health and wellness, economic development, and arts and cultural development for our community. Today, Latinos in Minnesota represent over 350,000 people who are dispersed throughout the state. Minnesota Latinos are among the third fastest growing groups in Minnesota and also continue to contribute to the demographic and economic growth of the country. I am here to, to seek your support for Senate File 2546, which appropriates funds for clues to expand arts and cultural programming um, and to celebrate our cultural and traditions through the arts. We have started this work a couple of years ago but obviously the demand is tremendous and your support would help us um, provide some expansion and some new opportunities to support local Latino artists to access professional and cultural development and develop place making and cultural corridors, particularly in Minneapolis and St. Paul where our offices are, so that we can contribute, continue to contribute to the economic development of our neighborhoods and our communities. 
Now I'd like to pass it on to my colleague, the Director of Arts at Clues, who will introduce our arts center work. And please state your name for the record. My name is Hannah Novio Erickson. Um, buenas tardes and good afternoon. Um, as I said, my name is Hannah Novio Erickson, and I'm the Associate Director of Arts and Cultural Engagement at CLUES, Comunidades Latinas Unidas en Servicio. Uh, we, we seek support for our arts and cultural engagement programming to expand Latino cultural experiences and community engagement initiatives that preserve and celebrate Latino cultural traditions. A direct legacy fund appropriation from the Minnesota legislature will expand our programming by supporting artist fellowships, apprenticeships, and professional development opportunities, including business development training, artist networking, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, and demonstration par partnerships. Um, Clues operates Minnesota's only Latino culture-centered arts gallery. Um, and provides the space, knowledge, and capacity for emerging artists to access broader community audiences. Latinos face the starkest funding inequities for culturally tailored arts programming. Legislative support can help us address this gap, lift the voices of Latino artists, and provide access to high quality and artist and community driven programming. Our arts programs foster community wellness, economic development, and preservation of our Latino heritage um, on east side of St. Paul and on Lake Street in Minneapolis. Through cultural preservation and arts-based engagement, CLUES will connect and catalyze Latino artists to access capital and small business entrepreneurship. With legacy funding support, a portion of the funds will be dedicated to expanding cultural engagement and deepening of our cultural traditions in greater Minnesota, particularly in Mankato, Austin, and Wilmer, where Clues has offices and established partnerships. And with that, Mr. Chair, this completes our presentation, and I stand ready for questions. <laughs> Any questions from members? Well, thank you very much. Thank you both for being here, and Senator Mann for chief author of this bill. Any closing closing remarks from you, Senator? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, just again, very excited for this program um, and the community that this serves, and I hope that you will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, we'll lay over Senator Fowle, twenty. 546 for possible inclusion in a legacy omnibus bill. Next is Senate File 26, all file, Senator Bolden. And welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am grateful to be before you to be able to present Senate File 2605. Uh, this is a request for $2 million to rehabilitate the George Stoppel Stone House Barn, uh, House and Barn in Olmstead County and to construct an accessible pathway to the site. Um, just as a bit of historical background, this farmstead is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, this, uh, the $2 million request will be matched with private donations from individuals and foundations uh, for a total historic rehabilitation project cost of $3 million. Um, so uh, this project is shovel ready um, and the focus will be on uh, immigration, agriculture, and tr the traditional Dakota homeland. Um, so I'll be brief, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you. Welcome and state your name for the record. Hello, Mr. Chair. My name is Wayne Ganaway. I'm Executive Director of the History Center of Olmstead County. You may proceed. Thank you, and thank you uh, for the committee uh, for uh, hearing my testimony. Um, as the Senator mentioned, that we will be matching um, any state funds by at least a, a million dollars, and we um, are confident that we have the donors lined up for that. Uh, George Stoppel, along with his brother, were immigrants. Um, they came to the United States from Germany in 1848, and they settled that very same land in 1856 before Minnesota became a state. And they purchased that land from the United States government. And today, those buildings remain intact, buildings that were built in the 1860s and 70s, along with two man-made caves that are 60 feet deep that they dug out with their bare hands. 
This is rare in Minnesota, and such an intact collection of farmstead buildings is becoming vanishingly rare in Minnesota. We are shovel ready. Olmstead County Historical Society already has constructions and drawings um, prepared by historical architects who meet the U.S. Secretary of Interior's professional standards for historic architecture. We have uh, recent experience doing, uh, implementing these projects with uh, recent rehabilitation of the smokehouse also on that property. Our educational focus will be on immigration, agriculture, and the traditional Dakota homeland. It only makes sense that we will be focusing on immigration because the Stopples were immigrants, like so many Minnesotans who built this state. More than that, Rochester is home to many, many immigrants of diverse backgrounds and communities. In fact, 14% of Rochester's population is uh, first, uh, first generation immigrant. And this is a critically important um, segment of our, of our state that needs to be heard and whose stories need to be part of our history. George Stoppel Farmstead will bring a range of community members together to build a cross-cultural understanding among those who live in and visit Olmstead County, including the millions of Mayo Clinic visitors. And regardless of ethnic or cultural background, visitors will feel pride in their own family history and traditions, each with their own unique challenges and adversities that they have overcome, like so many immigrants before us. And finally, our vision for this site is to cultivate a sense of belonging through the land. That is the common denominator for so many of us here in Minnesota, the land. And that is the common denominator for this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Conway. Good storytelling. Um, any questions from members? Senator Green? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm also a little more concerned when, when we start doing these. Is, uh, so the question of uh, either the author or the testifier, uh, has any work been done on this in the past, on this uh, site? Yes, there has been uh, cyclical um, and remedial maintenance done in the past, but this is the first uh, comprehensive uh, project and the first rehabilitation of any of these properties or any of these buildings on the property. Follow up, Mr. Uh, Senator Green. Just one more question, Mr. Chair. Something to, to, to look into, and I'll, I'll check on it too. Have you gone through the process to make sure that this site is eligible for legacy funds? Yes, uh, we have. It is listed on the National Register of Historic Properties, so on a state level basis, so it is eligible. Um, and like the smokehouse, which I mentioned in my testimony, um, we went through the Minnesota Historical um, and Grant Program legacy funds um, and received and went through that eligibility um, vetting process. So a building um, that is of the same historic nature on this property went through that process. So each of these other buildings, the stone house and the barn, uh, meet those same standards. So it is eligible, unequivocally. Okay, Senator Green. Right, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gunaway, for your explanation. And uh, Senator uh, Bowden, any concluding re remarks? Uh, just that this would be an important project for uh, my community, and I would appreciate member support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will lay over Senate File 2605 for possible inclusion and legacy on a bus bill. Thank you both. And next is uh, Senator Nelson, Senate File 726. Welcome. Children's Museum of Rochester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. You may proceed, Senator. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I am so pleased to bring Senate File 726 uh, to the Legacy Committee. This is a request for SPARC. It's the Children's Museum in Rochester. I'll just briefly, their mission is to enrich the lives of young learners by creating shared interactive experiences that engage people of all ages in the joy of play. It's learning through play. 
uh, the power of learning and the sense of community. And 70% uh, of our visitors are from Minnesota. 81 out of 87 counties come to the Spark Museum in Rochester. And we've seen 87% admission growth between 21 and 2022. And we know how important past uh, post-pandemic uh, learning is. And I think this is a, a wonderful statistic as well. 16,000% growth in free and reduced admission in the, in the last, uh, between the last two years. And this is what's so important. I know many of you share uh, my passion for education and how important it is and the joy of learning with our youngest learners. And children's museums are in a unique position to do that. But you know, not every child has the ability to get to a children's museum. Um, and one of the things that I'm so appreciative of is the specific focus on making sure um, a uh, resource like this is available to all kids. And that's one of the things that uh, you will hear about today. I would like to turn it over to my testifier, uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission, and then I'll have a few closing comments. Yes, and welcome, and please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Heather Nessler. I am the Executive Director of the Children's Museum of Rochester, also known as SPARC. I also want to thank uh, members of the committee for hearing this testimony, and Senator Nelson for authoring and introducing our bill. I'm here to today to speak about Senate File 726, it's funding that would build upon successful initiatives funded with previous appropriations from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with the goal of increasing access and engagement for diverse audiences through Sparks programs and exhibits, which will promote Minnesota arts, culture, and history. At our core, we focus on STEAM, cultural connectedness, and health and well-being through interactive exhibits and programs in our collaborative learning environment. The story of Spark began as the pandemic was ramping up locally. We opened our doors in August 2020, expecting to serve around 40,000 visitors in our first year. Now, just over two years later, we have engaged with more than 150,000 visitors at our museum. Our economic development region serves a population of approximately 520,000 people. And while, as Senator Nelson said, our admission has grown by 87% between 2021 and 2022, we clearly have more families to reach. Even still, we want to celebrate that we served individuals from 81 counties in Minnesota and access to the museum, which means access free and reduced admission fees, has increased by 1,600% since August 2020, which is an expense we incurred from our general operations budget. We are a unique children's museum. Throughout the year, we have implemented more than 750 hands-on programs in our space with more than 200 community partners. As the director of SPARC, it's my personal mission to continue to find ways to serve more families, all families in our community and region. This is why we also take SPARC into the classrooms at local schools through our Museum to Go program and into community through the activation of educational play in local parks. This year, we are pleased to partner with organizations like the American Indian Education Department from Rochester Public Schools, ACLA, the Alliance of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Latin Americans, the Pomoja Women, a group that exists to empower the women and girls of East African heritage, the Ronald McDonald House, which serves as a safe haven for families with children, of children with devastating illnesses, Families First Head Start, and more. We provide enrichment, special accommodations, and most importantly, free access to our museum for organizations like these in our community. We intentionally focus on early childhood screening and parent education so that the youngest members of our future generation receive support and are met with and meet developmental milestones, which include interventions and support. In other words, we wrap around the whole family and all families. With the appropriation of the funding from Legacy Committee, SPARC can increase programming efforts and access for the children and families that are in need of enrichment. We aspire to introduce our families to rich cultural traditions and diversity in arts and language. We have a successful foundation to build upon with programs like celebrations around the world, sign language story time, the exploration of different art mediums, yoga, and many more. Children's museums across Minnesota have become an even more critical community asset, serving families needing educational opportunities outside the home and school. We see tremendous need in our community and we don't anticipate the need to subside. In fact, we expect 100,000 visitors just this year with approximately 20% of those visitors accessing the museum for free 
um, or reduced admission because of the need in our community. It's our duty to see that this gap is filled, and I really appreciate your time and consideration of Senate File 726. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nesser. Any question from members? Okay. Very good. We're moving along. And, and any closing remarks, Sarah Nelson? Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, this is the Legacy Committee. I just want to share the success that the Legacy Committee has had here. Um, so in 2012, Spark received Legacy funding towards opening our first museum. But it was part of, uh, and th again, this was a great partnership, the Minnesota Children's Museum, Rochester. So we grew with them, we learned with them, and thanks to the legacy funding, we were able to open that much smaller museum, um, about uh, 4,000 square feet. Now, 11 years later, we're operating in a much larger facility, one that uh, is in our local mall. And we have a museum that's double that size, and as you noticed, 100,000 visitors. And I just want to thank you, Mr. Chair, and the Legacy Committee. I just want you to know the importance of the work you do here, and a starting can lead to something even greater. And now we want to continue to grow and continue to really be able to serve all of our kids and all the kids who come to visit who might not be able to come. be able to come without legacy funding uh, today. And so again, I just bring this before you. It's an honor to be in front of you, and I'd appreciate your consideration as you put your bill together, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Nelson, and thank you, Ms. Kessler, for your testimony. And you. we will put this into consideration uh, as we lay over Senate file 726 for possible inclusion in our legacy on up this bill. So uh, next is Senator Mitchell, uh, Senate File 2938, and tagging to what Senator Nelson just said that that one thing, one great thing leads to another. You know, I, and this is for members. I often tell people that you know if if they don't know what we do here in the Senate, when you see that legacy logo, it's what we do. I'm involved in the legacy logo there. So I was told the prop was okay. I thought I. Improvise a little bit until they have that set up. There we go. So. I appreciate that. Although, it's, do we have to sign it in as a testifier? No. Yes, testify. Yeah, you can. You can. So, welcome. Welcome. Something Thank you so much. This is my first time here. Um, so, I'm glad it can be a little festive. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is Senate file number 2938. Um, it, is, it is a very modest ask, and it is that um, funds be appropriated for a grant to the Hong Du Wu Guan um, uh, program to help create cultural arts program. They do a lot of things like the lion dance, as you were shown, um, calligraphy, martial arts, uh, different programs to invest uh, children in Chinese culture. Uh, I have two testifiers here with me today who will be very quick if I can turn it over to them. Mr. Chair? Yes, welcome. And please state your name for the record, whoever go first. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, community member members. And uh, thank you, uh, Senator Mitchell, uh, for being chief author for Carry Our Bill. Uh, my name is Cai Yun Zhou. I am an uh, executive uh, director of Hongdo Wu Guan. And uh, I was born and raised in Sichuan province in China. And uh, I met my husband, Adrian, in China when he was living there and uh, learning about the culture. So we moved here in Minnesota in 2006 and uh, have been raising our family here since. Uh, I have been teaching Chinese language and culture in Twin Cities since uh, September of 2006 and I have been a uh, part of a different Chinese uh, cultural groups in Minnesota since then such as like Minghua Chinese School, Minghua Choir, and the Qipao Society, and the Chinese Lion Dance. My husband and I wanted the opportunity to support and engage the community, not just um, entertain them. Our goal is to be able to provide a program with 30 to 50 kids at no cost to the children. We will help transform them uh, those students into performance team and uh, 
through this team, the kids will be able to express themselves and show the, uh, what they have learned from the program. Um, through our expertise, the program aims to cater to diverse of, uh, children with uh, uh, varying ability and uh, interests. This, this is why we offer the range of activities such as Chinese culture, Chinese art, calligraphy, um, cultural learning, and the line dance. When I'm talking about the Chinese art, so this is the one uh, sample. This is the Chinese, Chinese paper cutting. So it's just um, use the papers and the scissors. Okay, so this is just one sample, um, uh, what I did. And, uh, so I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Mitchell, and again for carrying uh, this uh, bill with us. And I want to thank you uh, to the community, uh, to this uh, opportunity to speak, and I appreciate your support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And next, that's the fire. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Her, and thank you, Senator Mitchell, for uh, authoring our, this bill. And. My name is Adrian Stockman. I am a volunteer with the organization and a uh, instructor, a volunteer instructor with the organization. This initial request is to make, uh, make it so the transition from volunteer endeavor to well-run vehicle for enrichment is as seamless as possible. As a startup nonprofit, it can be hard to make it to set goals and make, it make ends meet. To be able to present a real and complete program from the outset, uh, to provide all the materials and equipment needed for the success, regardless of the location or setting that we're in. Um, we want to be able to do this with um, providing, again, an, a, a, a no-cost program, but also so that we don't need any added um, supplements for this particular after-school program. Uh, we have paper, scissors, uh, you know, desks, tables. We don't want to have any, any uh, uh, boundaries or barriers uh, that would stop us working with one community group or another or one char charter school or one school program. We don't want anything to stop um, us being able to provide this to, to the kids we're, we're looking to serve. Having the funds for the role of an executive director would be one of the other things that we would be using these monies for so that we could have someone who can devote their time to, to this endeavor without just as, as, you know, uh, oh, when I'm done with my work or I'm done with, you know, these other things, that they really take responsibility and take oh, initiative and um, can, can make this something that is not only working just one time but can be grown and work uh, in continuance in the future, something where someone can graduate from this program and even be a part of it even later uh, down the road. Um, and also, the fact is that I want to build um, bridges with this program and instead of cultural barriers, we want to cross over. I myself am not of Chinese de descent, but this really was part of my life for so long. And I know that it can help to um, uh, smash some of these walls down that keep us from knowing that everyone is okay and everyone actually has something to bring to the table. Um, that's what we want to do. That's what we want to show the kids here. Um, and thank you, Senator uh, Chair Her for uh, hearing us. Thank you, committee, for hearing us and allowing us to present. Thank you, Senator Mitchell, for authoring uh, this bill. And thank you very much. Any question from members? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you are the, the folks who started this. How long has it been going? And do you have any other uh, uh, revenue sources for it? Um, Thank you, thank you, Senator uh, uh, Chair Her. Thank you, Senator Green, for your question. We, um, the revenue sources that we have uh, for this program, we currently are renting spaces out of different dance studios, and then we have our classes in there. And the class um, tuition will be transferred into paying for programs, paying for props and products that we can't find locally. And um, but. Uh, what we also will be doing is soliciting donations from the community, but also those members who um, find it within their heart to, uh, instead of taking up our offer for our offer of free classes, pay for the classes that they 
that they uh, come to, then that again supplements and act allows us to sponsor other people, other endeavors, and again, improve and continue to improve our, our, our products, our materials, and the equipment we use. So um, aside from that, the, the photos that we have uh, provided, those are shows. Um, many of them, um, when they, uh, we've done shows at Best Buy, Corporate, Target, Corporate, um, Casino Junction, these are paid performances, and so they can go upwards into you know um, sev uh, several thousand dollars, depending on what the what the what the uh, customer wants us to perform and how long. And so our goal is again, as as a team, is to set out in the community, not only doing free shows where where necessary or or uh, able, is also to be taking advantage of um, the corporate interests in having a a uh, a represented representative activity on Chinese New Year, and then we, fa we, we facilitate that, and then we also get monies from that. And we usually anticipate 17 to 20 shows a year um, based on the different organizations involved. And we go as far as Wisconsin. I've done show, uh, we've done shows previously in California even, where that's where we get a lot of the monies um, once the program has started and kicked off. And um, so... Uh, any follow-up, Senator? Yeah, Mr. Chair. So, you're, I'm only going to ask one more question because we have a lot of bills to go through. So, um, you are a 501c3 and not a private organization. We are current. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stockman. Se thank you, uh, Chair Her. Thank you, Senator Green, for your question. We are currently working on our 501c3 status. We are a local nonprofit as of now. Um, we have registered with the state as a nonprofit, and we are currently going through that. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for the testify. I see a mascot there. Maybe you can explain what I'm sure sure that is connection to line dance, and you know it it takes uh, uh, physical agility to do that. It probably promotes some exercise from younger people too when they're part of your class. But explain a little bit about that before we move to the next te testifier. Sure. Thank you, uh, Chair Her. Yes. So the lion that we have. So this is a Chinese lion again. Most Chinese people never saw a lion in their life, so uh, this is an amalgamation of what they imagined it could be. It ends up being originally used for um, chasing away bad spirits at the uh, end of an old year and the beginning of the new year. And uh, in the local communities, local Asian communities, um, restaurants, businesses, individuals will use this uh, performance, again, as a way to make a firm break with the old and in with the new. For example, the mirror starts to reflect and scare away your negative spirits, your bad mojo. The horn holds the power, so you never touch these two spots. But everywhere else is where you kind of get the mojo rubbed off on you. So the good vibes come from the fur. Yeah, the good. So as you do your performance, you're not only just supposed to be by, you know, look at me, look at me. You're supposed to go around and, and be a, a part of the show. And so, people will come up to the line, and in, in the performance, they will be, you know, uh, touching, and as he's moving around, there's also musical accompaniment. We didn't want to make it too much of a ruckus in this uh, solemn place. So there's musical accompaniment, and then there occasionally are tricks. Wow. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the demonstration. <laughs> and I suppose we may clap. I know that <laughs> the Senate rules, no clapping, but I suppose we can clap. And, uh, and, uh, so, so, Mr. Chair, um, I think there's a lot of a benefit in sharing cultures um, and that education. Um, I know in my community and neighboring communities, there is a large um, Chinese population um, who are anxious to share that culture. And so I think there's great value in this. And I appreciate you considering this. Thank you, Sam uh, Mitchell. And th thank you, Mr. Stockman and Ms. Uh, Joel, for coming to uh, present present your uh, or, or present your proposal, uh, and uh, we will lay over Senate File 2938 for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Legacy Bill. 
Thank you, and um, hopefully, maybe after after the before the end of year, you can train all members of our legacy committee <laughs> in, in the line dance there, and maybe we can celebrate Chinese New Year together. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Next is Senator McEwen, um, Senate File 1195. Well, that's a tough act to follow, Mr. Chair, but we'll do our best. <laughs> right. Anytime you're ready, Senator McCune. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Um, I am very excited to present Bill uh, Senate File 1195 for um, one point. Uh, one five million in the next biennium to support wilderness inquiry and the canoe mobile program. This project will connect 11,000 youth and families from every region of Minnesota to hands-on activities in the outdoors that teach about the history and cultural heritage of our state. Wilderness Inquiry is a leader in providing inclusive outdoor educational and recreational programming in communities all across Minnesota. And since 2015 has directly engaged more than 93,000 Minnesota youth. This is personal to me, uh, growing up in Duluth, living in Duluth, raising children in Duluth. Uh, we participate up north in many nature-based activities and go up to the Boundary Waters often. Um, and these activities connect us and link us to Minnesota's outdoor heritage and history. So I understand firsthand the importance of place-based learning for the development of young people. And I hope that you will join me in support of this project to provide similar opportunities for 11,000 Minnesota students and families in the next biennium. Um, it is so important that all Minnesotans, regardless of ability or income or background, can access our state's public lands and waterways. For 45 years, Wilderness Inquiry has been a leader in outdoor accessibility as well, and they are a national model for adaptive, inclusive programming. Equity and access to outdoors is at the very heart of this bill. I am very pleased to introduce now um, two colleagues who will share more on the potential impact of this funding for the next biennium, uh, Willie Tully and uh, Sintag Haas. Welcome, and please take your name for the record, so whoever is gonna testify first. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Chair and members. Um, my name is Willie Tully. I'm the Development Director for Wilderness Inquiry. Um, we're a 45-year-old Minnesota-grown nonprofit that exists to connect people to each other in the natural world. Um, at Wilderness Inquiry, our core belief is that everyone belongs in the outdoors. And those two words are really important to us. Everyone belongs. Our mission exists so that every single kid in Minnesota, every family, when they think about the outdoors, they can see themselves there. They can feel safe and connected and feel like they belong. So here's the reason we're here today. On average in the United States, children spend about seven minutes a day playing outside and seven hours behind screens. Every single day that's seven minutes outside and seven, minutes, or seven hours behind a screen. With your support, we have an opportunity to change that. Through this project, Wilderness Inquiry seeks to connect 11,000 youth and families to immersive outdoor educational and recreational experiences, from introductory day trips through our canoe mobile program, to multi-generational family camping trips, to immersive backcountry trips in the Boundary Waters. The goal is to provide a continuum of supports that empower people to find connection to the outdoors at whatever stage of their journey they're in. We also know that access to the outdoors isn't equitable for everyone. Of participants in Wilderness Inquiry programs, 74% receive financial aid. More than 50% identify as BIPOC. On our extended camping trips, 32% 32 32 of participants identify as a person with a disability. And 30% of the people we serve live in greater Minnesota. These numbers matter as we seek to promote equity and outdoor access for individuals and communities historically under-resourced and underrepresented in outdoor spaces. And that's what this project is about. I'm joined today by my colleague, Mr. Haas, who will help share how Wilderness Inquiry programs are connecting the next generation to Minnesota's rich history, cultural heritage, and outdoor going traditions. Thanks. Thank you, Willie. Thank you. And hello, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Mr. Uh, Sintang Haas. Mm -hmm. I'm a teacher at Harding High School. 
in St. Paul and the staff lead for Harding's Earth Club. We've partnered with Wilderness Inquiry for the past seven years to connect uh, youth from the east side of St. Paul to truly immersive outdoor experiences. Adventures that have been truly uh, life cha changing for some of our students. <coughs> um, Harding's been in the news recently. One of our students was killed. We, we've had some incredible challenges as a school community. And it's so clear that our youth are under a tremendous amount of stress and strain. However, on that day, um, on that very sad day, 18 students and I were in the Boundary Waters with Wilderness and Korea. For four days, we experienced the magic of the North Woods and had some of the best experiences of our lifetimes, truly. I will forever be thankful that our 18 students were in the Boundary Waters um, that weekend instead of at Harding that day. We were lucky enough to find ourselves in nature, in a place that was nurturing, healing, and safe. My hope is that these experiences would be available to many more youth at Harding and at schools across Minnesota. This is uh, why what Wilderness Inquiry does is so important. Their programs provide opportunities for youth to connect to the natural world, whether it be at Phelan, uh, Phelan Lake, or further uh, afield at the Boundary Waters. Our state has an incredible um, natural resources and a rich outdoor heritage, but most of our students and many of our young don't have the resources or opportunities to experience the outdoors. Wilderness Inquiries programs change that. They meet our youth where they are, provide uh, supportive staff, adaptive gear, deliver lessons that go well beyond what, we, what I can teach in the classroom. And ultimately, we give people an opportunity to connect with themselves, each other, and the outdoors. I know that legacy funding plays a huge part in making this work possible. Because of your support, students like the ones I work with at Harding are able to learn, explore, and find healing and connection with the outdoors. I'll leave you with a quote from one of my students um, from a couple years ago. The beauty of Mother Nature is beyond what anybody could imagine. This trip inspired me and opened my mind about the importance of preserving the environment for future generations. I hope that you'll support this project so that many more youth and families across Minnesota can connect with the history, culture, and traditions that make Minnesota outdoors such an incredible place. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we can take questions. Thank you, Mr. Haas and Mr. Tully, and uh, also Senator McCune for your testimony. Um, yeah, question from Senator Queen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the canoe mobile has been around for some time, and uh, I'm looking at, at the funding source here. Is this an increase from fund, past funding? Um, yes, Chair and, and Senator Green, this is an increase over our funding from the last biennium, and, and um, the, the, it's an expansion of our programming to build from those introductory experiences through Canoe Mobile to also provide repeat and reinforcing experiences for families um, and, and multi-generational engagement that includes overnight camping trips and extended trips to the Boundary Waters. So that's, what, that's the reason for the increased ask. Any follow-up? Yes, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, what is the increase, and can it be scaled? So, you know, uh, as as uh, Chairman Her puts this bill together, I can almost guarantee you there's going to be way more requests than there is money, and so it's it's going to you know you know not always going to get what you ask for. So, can the project be scaled, <clears throat> Mr. Tooley? Yeah, Chair Senator Green. Thank you. Um, the project can be scaled. It can be scaled down or up, uh, and um, you know, this every dollar that goes into the program supports getting a kid or a family member outside. Um, this ask is for just over $100 a kid, you know, per, per participant. We think that's a really incredible investment in Minnesota kids. As I mentioned, we serve um, youth and families all across the state. 30% of our of our participants are in greater Minnesota. And so um, it can be scaled, but but for every dollar that gets subtracted, that's a kid that can't, can't get outside with us. And we think it's really important, um, and we're asking for full funding for this project so that we can um, live into connecting 11,000 kids to the outdoors over the next two years. We also, one more thing, um, 
Uh, state funding is matched four to one from private funding. So really this, this investment, we, we um, increase the impact dramatically through corporate foundation support, individual giving, and other fundraising that we do um, so, so, that, so that state dollars are really being leveraged for a greater impact across Minnesota. One more question, Senator Mr. Green. Chair. Okay. Um, the Canoe Mobile is also, uh, for those who don't know, I, I believe this is a nationwide uh, program. Uh, and you say you're expanding it. So two questions and then and then I'll be done. One, do you have enough safeguards in place? Because we've dealt with this before where legacy money sometimes gets transferred out of the state, or it used to, and we worked hard to try to prevent that. Do you have safeguards in place for that? And then also you didn't really answer the question on what was the funding last year. Oh, Mr. sorry. Tully. Um, yeah, Chair Herb, Senator Green. Yeah, so our funding in the last biennium was 400 and 400, and our ask in this biennium is 525 and 625, and that scaled to increase our programs over time. Um, thanks. And, and, and to the second question, yeah, we have really strong fiscal controls. Um, every uh, Minnesota state dollar that gets invested in the program stays in Minnesota. We're headquartered here. 40% um, of our program happiness here, 100% of our Minnesota state funding stays, stays in the state. Okay. Well, thank you both for your time. Oh, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, that kind of goes on to ask what he was asking about. So when the canoe mobile goes out of Minnesota, that funding would be from that state then? Is that how that works? Or Thank you. Mr. Tooley. Um, Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Wessenberg. Yeah, that's correct. So we do, um, in addition to the to the four to one funding we support um, in Minnesota programming and state state support that's here, um, we also pursue private philanthropy that that supports our um, national impact through the program. And then we also work with federal partners, the Forest Service, the Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management. Those federal dollars help support that um, that national program. So so we're funding fundraising on the state and national level, but um, but our we're headquartered here, and, and Minnesota is our backyard. And this, you know, these dollars are, are to connect Minnesota kids to Minnesota's outdoors. That's really important to us. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you both for for testifying. Um, my condolences go to the families and the students and teachers and everybody at Hardings. You know, for the loss, uh, wilderness uh, exploration and arts and culture do help reduce violence. You know, and Thank you, um, Teacher Hans, for the work that you do over there, and give, give them my regard. Thank you. Sam McEwen, any closing remark on this? Just thank you very much for considering this request, Chair. And um, you know, those of us who have had um, an abundance of wilderness opportunities in our lives know just the value of what that brings to your life. And, and it's something that, that is unique and, and irreplaceable. So the more young people we can give that experience to, um, I think it, as you said, it does, it does wonderful, has reverberating effects for the whole community. Thank you. And now we lay Senate file 1195 for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. Thank you. And Thank you. next, uh, we're going to change schedule a little bit because uh, of, um, of members have to rearrange their schedule. So I want to call Senator Putin up to, the, to testify of, uh, or speak of Senate file 1882. That's Funka Arts Programs Appropriation. Anytime you're ready, uh, Senator Putin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be before this committee. It's my first time, uh, and so Welcome. I very much appreciate this opportunity to visit with you all about a couple things that are really important. And I do want to be perfectly clear for the sake of the record uh, that we uh, incredibly appreciate your allowing us to jump ahead uh, on the menu, as it were. Uh, but again, to clear the record, it's not out of uh, capitulation to me or my own personal needs. My friend Nasser here has a six-week-old at home in St. Cloud, and she needs to get home to her kid. So I want to thank you all for accommodating testifiers and myself and allowing us to kind of jump in the line a little bit. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, Senate File 1882 is based on a proposal for the Somali-led organization Kajug. 
uh, that's been successfully funded by uh, the Minnesota Humanities Commissions in the past and by the Legacy Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Um, I was just learning from my friend here that Kajug means uh, a path to a brighter future. Uh, I didn't know I got that actually perfectly right, but it's something like that, and he's going to correct me in about a minute. Um, but what this organization does is it creates opportunities for cultural heritage awareness and education within the Somali community and beyond, generating important dialogue between Somali folks and the communities that they live in. Uh, and I can tell you how important that dialogue is in my own hometown of St. Cloud. Uh, the more we talk together, the better we get along uh, and the stronger our communities are. Now, over the past eight years, there's been tremendous success with this program in communities like St. Cloud, Rochester, Wilmer, and the Twin Cities. But we have ongoing challenges and opportunities that remain in these communities and beyond. Now, with offices in Twin Cities and Moorhead, Kajug is one of the only Somali-led organizations in the state that has the capacity to truly appreciate and complete this work throughout the entire state. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, we know that sometimes some of this equity work is too cities-based, frankly. That's my editorial as a greater Minnesotan, is that oftentimes we focus our effort too much on these concerns within the seven county metro area. This is an organization that is poised and has the capacity to do great work throughout the whole state on issues that are very important to us. Now in the past, funding for this uh, cultural heritage project has ranged from 200 dollars to $400,000. But having seen the success of this program and the ongoing needs in some of these communities across the state for cultural awareness and education, I want to encourage you to support the full funding request, if we could, Mr. Chair, of $2 million. Now, Mr. Chair, here to offer examples of the success of this proposal is Mr. Mohamed Farah. Good. Uh, please state your name. Welcome and state your name for the record. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for granting, granting us the opportunity to, to uh, present this bill before you. I would like to express my gratitude to Senator Putnam for his leadership and uh, advocacy in uh, bringing this bill uh, to your attention. Uh, my name is Mohamed Farah. I, I am the executive director of Kajog. Kajog is a Somali term. It means to stay away uh, and, and uh, alert yourself from negative things. So the idea is to put young people, to, to get young people away from negative things and put them on the right path, which we believe is education, um, and, 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 and help them succeed. Uh, established in 2007, our mission has been, uh, continues to be, to provide community-based and culturally specific programs and services to young people and their families through education, the arts, and economic development. As a statewide organization that primarily works with the East African community across the state, we have been coordinating Somali arts and cultural heritage projects throughout Minnesota for years. Our work focuses on building trust, cohesiveness, and relationships within the Somali community and with the greater community through our arts and, cult and, our arts and cultural heritage programs called FUNCA. And FUNCA is a Somali term, which means the arts in Somali. Our FUNCA program includes a weekly arts club, three eight-week immersive workshops for young people with a recognized artist, and public arts presentation, and intercultural community engagement. By using spoken word, storytelling, visual arts, and plays, we provide the critical opportunities for Somali youth to engage in intercultural dialogues which creates vital local connections, trust, and relationships across our state. The proposed bill before you will bring necessary funding that will impact many communities in our state. Since 2015, we have been the recipients of legacy funds through the Minnesota, Minnesota Humanity Center and have impacted thousands of Minnesotans across the state, not just within the Somali community. Uh, many folks across the state with different backgrounds. Uh, we have brought people from all backgrounds together using art and build long-lasting relationships between many communities. Mr. Chair and committee members, we have a lot of work ahead of us, particularly in greater Minnesota, where the Somali-American population is growing by the day. Intercultural dialogue opportunities are limited, resulting in a significant amount of misunderstanding, fear, and mental, and sometimes cause physical harm. Together, we have the power to change this and considering the bill before you uh, is, is something that we urge you to do. As we live in a critical time, uh, your continued leadership and advocacy on this issue and this bill is essential. I would like to express my appreciation to you, Mr. Chair, and committee, committee members for pushing uh, for this bill. I also would like to thank Mr. Putnam, uh, Senator Putnam for his leadership 
Uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I would like to call Nasro Mohammed, who is a parent uh, from St. Cloud and wants to say a few words. Welcome, Ms. Mohammed. Please state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Nasro Mohammed, and I'm from St. Cloud. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you for giving me the time to say a few words. My name is Nasro, and I'm from St. Cloud. I want to testify about the positive impact that this program has had on my son. He was able to develop his artistic skills, connect with his Somali-American identity, and appreciate diversity, inclusive, inclusivity. I also appreciate the fact that I was able to connect with people from different backgrounds and work with them in the programs. The art workshops increased my son's appreciation of the art while also increasing his awareness and knowledge of the Somali art, something that I struggled with growing up in Minnesota. I really didn't know how to identify with being American or Somali because I didn't have programs such as Kajok program. Um, I'm grateful for the educators and staff who made the program possible and hope that more children can have access to similar programs in the future. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Thank you. Any questions from members? Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to move the A1 amendment. A1 amendment is um, ahead of us. Uh, Senator Wiesenberg, can you please explain what the A1 amendment is? I can. Uh, so um, it was brought to my attention about a month ago that um, there are, so the University of Minnesota has 4-H, 4-H and they have uh, you know clay, clay shooting teams, and they are trying to limit the amount of money that they're given to these this sport. Um, and Clay pigeon shooting is one of the fastest growing sports in Minnesota and the nation. We have 340 high school teams in Minnesota, and we have almost 1,500 teams in 34 states, and it's you know something that's growing fast. So um, I was looking to maybe use some of this money for that too to give it to the University of Minnesota to help you know preserve this uh, Minnesota heritage. So um, do you or who who reads the amendment? Do you or So, Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, members, sorry, I was having a sidebar conversation here. The amendment would take the $1 million appropriation, you'll see that on line five. Uh, for both years, it would take half of that appropriation and appropriate it instead in those same fiscal years to the University of Minnesota Extension Office. Uh, to preserve Minnesota's shooting sports heritage by providing grants to Minnesota 4-H chapters that have members participating in state and national 4-H sanctioned shooting sports events. So it would take the appropriation, split it in half, and use the other half for uh, the purpose in the amendment. Correct. Um, and thank you, Chair. And uh, Senator Putnam, I thought that would be beneficial for you as well, being on the A committee. This would help our, our 4-H, 4-H teams. Thank you. Oh, and I would like to request. Sen oh, go ahead. Yep. Senator Pardon, um, any uh, re remark on, on this? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Wiesenberg, for this amendment. You know, fascinating enough, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, but Kajug actually works with 4 H already. Uh, so uh, this amendment is unnecessary, uh, and I ask members to vote against it. The whole purpose of this uh, bill, actually, uh, is to create moments of intercultural dialogue. Uh, and our dear friends at Kajug are already doing that through their work with 4-H. Uh, and it seems actually almost inappropriate to kind of micromanage their efforts in doing that when they are already being quite successful in the processes that they are currently employing. Uh, already with 4-H. Okay. Um, yes, Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Senator Putnam, um, and thank you, Chair. Um, it's not micromanaging. We're just trying to, you know, sheerly share funding and keep a heritage that seems like we keep being told myself. I feel like I'm getting put on the back burner here in the state of Minnesota. I grew up here. I'd like to have a heritage of mine also saved and we're not being heard. And if he works with 4-H, I'm sure he would like some of this to go towards that. Um, and, you know, the University of Minnesota is not even allowing these people to fundraise. And maybe he doesn't know this, I don't know. So it's information for you as well. So the University of Minnesota is you know, allowing 4-H to fundraise for their shooting sports, so they don't have money. So we need to, we need to help these, these kids in this, in this time. So thank you. Okay. I'll do first, you can. 
Mr. So, Chair, if I may. Yes. Uh, because uh, I think Senator Wiesenberg raises, a, a, a Wiesenberg raises a, an important point. Uh, and my friend Mr. Farrow would reply as well if, when he gets a moment. And I would want to suggest that actually one of the great things that I think we heard uh, from Ms. Muhammad was that uh, a lot of the folks we're talking about were born here too, right? And they're dealing with their own uh, negotiations of identity and their own cultural identity and figuring what that is. I would also suggest that as Chair of Agricultural Rural and Development, I can tell you all about the tremendous amount of money that we invest in 4-H, very gratefully, very glad to. I'm proud of the work that we're doing to support uh, uh, young folks uh, in their pursuit of uh, agricultural related industries or an agricultural lifestyle. We're doing that work in the Ag Committee. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to, to tell you more about it someday. Uh, and Mr. Farrow would like to speak as well, Mr. Yes. Chair, if that's acceptable. Yes, Mr. Farrer. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator, uh, Mr. Senator, I do want to make a comment. Um, Kajok is very proud. Uh, we are a proud partner of 4-H, and we continue to do so. Our 4-H is for, for, uh, our focuses on STEM. However, we are not here to take away the heritage of anybody. We are here to provide opportunities of uh, intercultural dialogue for young people across the state where they would not have a chance had we not be able to do the work, the amazing work that we have done. And so um, I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding here. And so we have been doing an amazing work across the state. Uh, and the idea is to continue that work uh, and, and really not focus anywhere else. So thank you, Mr. Senator, Mr. Chair. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank, thank you, Chair. I wasn't, I wasn't saying you're trying to take things away. I'm just saying my colleagues on the other side, are, we don't have a voice is what I'm trying to say. It's nothing against you. I'm just saying when we try to say something, our voices aren't heard. So thank you. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I support this amendment um, for a couple of reasons. One, I'm, I'm looking at the, the asks, and not, not just yours, Senator Putman, but I'm looking at the asks, and they've just gone up in, by huge amount, huge dollar amounts. And some of this is unprecedented, and even uh, by the testimony from, from the good senator, uh, the average funding for Kajug in the past years has been around two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. Now it's up to two million, and and so I don't. I honestly don't know where all the money's going to come from for all these asks. But uh, I think this is a a, a good amendment uh, because the the shooting sports is growing, and they are you know raising their own money, and so if we're going to fund uh, things to keep youth. It would be nice to spread the money around a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Senator Putnam. Uh, Mr. Muhammad would like to, uh, uh, Mr. Fet, uh, Farah would like to respond to that as well, if you may. Mr. Farah? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Senator Green, uh, we are asking $600,000 a year extra, uh, and, and, and you have a good point, a good question. The reason that we're asking those funds is because there are many cities that we were not, we didn't get a chance to uh, go and, and, and serve those communities. Uh, and, and, and what we're trying to do the next two years is expand our program and reach these cities. We're talking about from International Falls all the way to uh, uh, Delworth and, and other cities where we're seeing um, uh, new Americans um, um, moving there. And so uh, that's why it's very important that we ex expand our program. And that, that's where the extra funding is going. Thank you. And, and I can appreciate that. I really can. But I will, you know, back to reality, everybody that comes in is here because there's a need. But there's only so many dollars to go around. And it's hard to say that sometimes, but it's the truth. And, uh, and so if, if we were to try to fund every, everyone that comes in with a need, there's no possible way to do it. I mean, it and, and you look at all the requests, not only for this, but for the bonding and for every other... Uh, pot of money that we have. Someone is always wants it because they have an extreme need. And so it is our job here to try to put it where we think it's going to do the most good with, for the most people. So it's not that we're trying to uh, cut back anybody. It's that we need to look at things realistically here and, and the amount of money we have to spend. Thank you, Senator. Senator McEwen. Uh, Senator Putnam, you want to... 
Well, I, I was just going to say that I appreciate Senator Green's point. It's a, it's a real one. There's a limited number of dollars. That's incredibly important. But I would, in behalf of this proposal in particular, argue that it's one where the need increases as the days pass, both in terms of its magnitude and its scope. But more importantly, uh, I would argue that this is a, a proposal and an organization that has a demonstrated record of competence and success. So yeah, totally with you. Not enough money to go around. 100% true. And it feels like everyone has every need. Uh, that's true too. Uh, but this, I would argue, is a, is a need that is growing and an organization that has a documented record of success at meeting that need. And that's a very important component, too, is, is what I would say. S Sarah McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I um, want to say thank you for bringing this bill. It, um, this is wonderful work that you're doing, and um, I, I'm really... Um, really supportive of it and um, I just I had a question for the um, for Senator Wiesenberg who brought the amendment um, that we're considering this a1 amendment um, if I if I may ask uh, the question of Senator Wiesenberg mr. chair yes Senator Wiesenberg which will you yell yes. go ahead yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is um, today we have a, a very long agenda. Um, we're hearing bills. Um, we've already heard about um, seven bills. This is the eighth. We have a very long calendar going into the evening, 34 bills um, that we're hearing. My question for Senator Wiesenberg is why this bill? Why, why this request? Why are, why are you bringing this amendment for a trap shooting program um, trying to take money from a request from Kajug um, for trap shooting? That's my question. Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not trying to take money from anybody. I'm trying to share money with people. And Putnam is the egg chair, so it's a 4-H program. I have people come to me saying that the University of Minnesota is take not letting them fundraise for this fast program, and this is a lot of money, so I thought we could share it with people. And I, I do think it's interesting, because like I, I saw some of your bills it's not asking for as much. I'm like, well, maybe you could get some more for like your um, zoo, the zoo in Duluth, where some zoos are asking for this exorbitant amount and you're asking for a little bit. It's like, well, maybe we could push a little more towards something else. Um, so I, I guess I don't understand how these things balance out, but we need to share the money equally. So um, that's why. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just some follow up. Um, you know, respectfully, we're, we're hearing 34 requests today for varying amounts of money, um, and um, it, all of us are, are hoping to get our request fully funded, or some we've even heard ask for, hey, if you have a little more, we'd take that too, and we'd make, put it to good use. Um, and the chair and will um, look at all of these requests and try to do the best job that he can at distributing those those resources that we have in an equitable way, in a way that meets as many needs as possible. Um, but I, I guess I, I am still, um, don't really have a good answer to my question, which is fine, um, but I, I, um, I find this to be, um, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't have words for it. Thank, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sam Chair, if I may. Uh, um, Senator, Senator Putton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just say, you know, uh, 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 with all due respect, Senator Wieselberg, you're, 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 you're new here, uh, and jurisdictions matter a great deal. Uh, the funding for 4-H does come through my committee, and that's where the funding for 4-H is going to go, through my committee. And that's where it comes from, and that's where it's great. Your concern with uh, 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 the shooting at uh, the U, that's an issue for the Higher Education Committee. There are other spaces and other jurisdictions where these issues are already being addressed. Uh, and that is a great place for your advocacy. And if you'd like to know more about what we're doing in ag, I'm happy to educate you. Thank you, Senator Putnam. And I do have a question before we move this, this bill. Uh, Senator Wiesenberg, could, could, this, could this be a separate legislation? Could this be a bill uh, on itself and not, not um, grab this, the same amount of money that Kaju is trying to aim for? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it could be. I, just, yeah, I, I'm just trying to help the you and the kids. So, yeah, I don't, it could be, yes. Okay. 
Well, I mean, um, if you like to do go that route, I certainly well, could could help you walk you through that. But you wanna do you wanna pursue and uh, make making motion for this amendment, then, Mr. Wiesenberg, uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Well, if we can do that, we can. I can withdraw the amendment, and we can work on this separately with you. Is that what you're asking, or? Yeah, we, we yeah. can certainly do, we can certainly do that. Yeah, um, why don't we do yeah. that? Okay, so, okay. And you know, if, if, Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd like to also offer my help as vice chair of higher education. Yeah. yeah. If you want to talk about what's going on over there, I can help you. We can talk about that. Okay. And that taking that uh, your your the advocates group or uh, the stake the stakeholder will come forth and present themselves as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, yes, Senator Icorn. If we're done on Senator Wiesenberg's mm -hmm. the underlying. Um, I'm still, I'm still wondering is, is Senator Wilson we're going to make a motion or he's going to make. I'm going to make a motion to withdraw the amendment. Okay. Thank you, so, sir. Sure. Okay, so Senator Wilson will withdraw the A1 amendment. Thank you, everybody. Senator Icon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in kind of around the discussion that Senator Green already started about this being such a large increase, uh, as we have time to do stuff, I haven't read through the entire 990s yet, but there's a different sites that pull 990s together. Charity Navigator is one of those, and it looks back at your 990s from, it's got 17, 19, and 20 on there. The administrative expenses for your organization look rather high, uh, 22, 28%, 44%. So with this ad increased additional money you're gonna get, can we expect that to go to administrative? Is it gonna go to programming? Um, would you be opposed to some comfort language that would ensure that it went towards programming instead of administrative? So if you could just talk about that piece of it too so we know that it is gonna be used for programming and not administrative. Mr. Farah. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, uh, this, uh, the funding that we're seeking will go 100% towards the program. Uh, I understand the numbers that you are looking at. I can bring the latest uh, 990 uh, with uh, the full reports, or the audits uh, that we passed. Um, and so uh, I can assure you that the funding will go directly to the program. Okay. Mr. Chair, as we look to put some of these together, it might be good, and we may want to look at some comfort language later, not for this organization specifically, but holistically all of them to make sure that as we're giving money out, it is for programming and not administrative in all areas of, of this legacy funding. So it might be something as we go forward with your bill that uh, hopefully I can work with you on and we can add some of that language. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ranking uh, Minority Leader uh, of, of this committee. Uh, point taken. Senator, uh, McHugh, uh, Senator Kunish. <laughs> thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and I'm, I'm a new chair. Um, in, in the Senate, and I chair the Education Finance Committee. And we heard a uh, request from um, Senator Nelson for the Rochester um, Children's Museum there. And then this evening, we heard another request um, by the same entity um, to, for monies for those. And in your experience as a um, being here in the Senate for a while and having sat on on committees and maybe other chairs that have are sitting on this committee that could speak to this too, when there is um, a double request in different committees, is it usual practice that they just receive one? Because um, if if they were to, for example, in this example, if Senator Nelson received those dollars here in legacy, um, would they then not be eligible to receive dollars in the Education Finance Committee? That's, I might be able to help answer that. Yes, I, Senator, Senator I, I, I Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hopefully I can add some context to that for you. I, I did have similar scenarios before Senator Kunis where I had districts that had children's museum, they received appropriation from the education budget, had a specific use and purpose. Those legacy funds also had a separate and specific use and purpose. So they did receive funds from both places, but had to be tailored to certain specific things. Uh, in the case of legacy, um, supplement, not supplant, it was used for new displays, um, new opportunities to uh, increase things in the museum to teach kids more things, where the money from the education budget allowed them to help bring additional students in. Um, I don't know if that's Senator Nelson's specific issue, but hopefully that helps add some context to what we've seen in the past uh, in that specific realm. 
Senator McCunish is... Um, Thank you, Senator yes. Icorn. Um, so perhaps there are opportunities for um, this organization to look at other, um, other committees where um, some of this funding might be, um, be very helpful. Um, perhaps in the future, if it's education related, you could um, certainly submit bills that would look for um, some kind of assistance, financial assistance around education. If it's such a large amount here in this, then um, maybe we can take a lesson and, and spread it out. So that's all I wanted to say. Any uh, final remarks from Senator Putin? Uh, this has been a very engaging uh, discussion, and I appreciate uh, the community, Mr. Farah and Ms. Muhammad, you know, even staying here longer for this, this discussion, all all around the subject of funka, right? Mm -hmm. Arts, yes. that's Thank in you. Somali. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And arts is what brought brought us together for unity. And so, any any remark, um, Senator Senator uh, Putnam, uh, before we lay this bill over for possible inclusion. I just want to thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for the, the vigorous conversation. I appreciate it. Um, I, and I also like the, the statement you just made, Mr. Chair, that arts bring us together. There's something special uh, about art, especially in the context of dialogue, whether that's intercultural or intracultural, interpersonal or intrapersonal. Art can do some wonderful things when we support it. So I appreciate the conversation, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, everyone. And we will lay over uh, Senate File 1882 for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. Okay, let's uh, speed along now. Oh, Sam Putnam, since uh, you're, you're here, uh, let's see. Uh, what we'll just go on with, with your bill. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. This one's going to be Senate real file quick. Senate File 2737, uh, St. Cloud Beaver Island Regional Trail. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, for the clarity of the record, the last time we accommodated my friend Nasro because she had to get home to her kid, this time I'm just being rude. <laughs> That's it. I'm just being rude, jumping in line. Uh, folks, the, the, the bill we have before us, uh, Senate File 2737, is incredibly simple. In 2019, uh, the city of St. Cloud was given some money uh, through this space uh, to do some work on the lovely Beaver Island Trail which is just a, a great place to go for a walk, to ride a bike. It actually connects our downtown to some of our suburban areas, goes along the river. It's a beautiful, nice little trail. Uh, we were given some money to do that in 2019, but then, uh, what's it called, uh, COVID. This COVID thing happened, and we weren't able to do it. So all we're asking for now is an extension to spend the money we've already been granted. And I have a testifier here in case we have any questions. Okay. Um Renee Matson, please state your name for the record. And Thank welcome. you, Chair. Renee Matson, I'm the Executive Director of the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. We're the organization that originally granted those funds to the Beaver Island Trail uh, construction. We are fully supportive of this extension. The funds have already been encumbered. They just hadn't been spent yet due to that little incident we discussed, COVID. <laughs> um, but we fully expect the project, if they're given the two-year extension, to be able to complete that get it off the books and have it ready for people to enjoy in the St. Cloud regional area. So we're very supportive of this request to extend the grant. Uh, members, any questions uh, to Senator Putnam, Bill, Senate File 2737, Senator Green? Thank you, just a quick one. Um, I don't see the amount in here. So what was the amount, uh, how much is left? And is the money that you're requesting even going to finish the project now? I'm assuming, like everything else, with inflation that's gone on, it's probably going to be much more. So is it going to be able to uh, even work? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Green. It was $900,000 was the initial appropriation. Uh, my understanding is the work has already begun. Perhaps Ms. Masson can provide a little bit more insight into specific details. Ms. Masson. Thank you. Uh, Senator Green, the work has been started. We fully expect the project to be completed in this time frame on budget. Good. All right, any further discussion? All right, Senator Pollan, closing remark? This one's pretty easy. I hope it's okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, and we will lay Senate file um, 27, 30, 2737 for possible inclusion and the Omnibus Legacy Bill. Thank, Thank you. you both. See, so next is uh, Senator McEwen. Yep. 
Senator McCune, Senator Fowle, 1817, Lake Superior Zoological Society. Okay, and I gather your, I, your testifier are on remote, so uh, for the testifier, when you're ready, you can turn on your camera and as soon as we call on you. So go ahead, anytime you're ready, Senator McCune. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and members uh, for hearing this, for this bill, Senate file number 1817. Uh, the Lake Superior Zoo is the 19th oldest zoo in the United States, as a matter of fact, and they are celebrating their 100 year anniversary this year. The Lake Superior Zoo does important conservation work and is also home to over 30 species of threatened and endangered animals, protecting our shared commons for generations to come. The zoo provides fun educational experience for children all across the Northland, from classroom field trips to Saturday family trips. At this time, I will pass our presentation, Mr. Chair, to the Chief Executive Officer of the Lake Superior Zoo, Haley Hedstrom, who is joining us on Zoom. Haley, welcome. Um, uh, please state your name for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. I want to thank Senator McCune for her support on Senate File 1817. My name is Haley Hedstrom, and as was said, I am the CEO of the Lake Superior Zoo in Duluth, Minnesota. And as Senator McCune said, we are celebrating our 100-year anniversary, which makes us the 19th oldest zoo in the U.S., which for being in the Midwest is quite an accomplishment. Uh, we have received funding from Legacy on previous projects, such as our immersive butterfly house, renovating our bald eagle habitat for two rescued birds, Buddy and Liberty, and our latest exhibit, which will be an innovative and dynamic experience that immerses our guests in the history of the zoo, as well as highlights the importance of our accreditation from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. We are one of three zoological facilities in the state of Minnesota that hold that accreditation, the other two being in the metro area. Uh, this funding ask is critical as we continue our forward momentum here at the LSU. We are asking for a total of $300,000 for the upcoming biennium to create a world-class snapping turtle habitat for one of our most charismatic animals named Nestor, as well as update our hoof stockyards to be the new home, uh, home of a herd of caribou. We would also engage the important research on the feasibility of a possible reintroduction of caribou. Some research had already been done and we wanna pick up where that left off to our region and develop educational programming around important indigenous stories of this species and other animals. Additionally, conservation topics as related to both turtles and hoofstock in Minnesota will be highlighted through that education and interpretive signage. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to discuss our proposed projects and your previous support of the Lake Superior Zoo. Member, any questions for the testifier, Senator McEwen? Uh, this is another hard bill. <laughs> Senator McCune, and uh, last word uh, for, for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, I appreciate very much your consideration of our request. The Lake Superior Zoo is a, is a gem in our community, and we appreciate any support that um, we are able to, to receive. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will uh, lay Senate file 1817 uh, for possible inclusion in the Legacy Animus Bill. Thank you to Senator McEwen and Ms. Henstrom. Okay, uh, next is Senate File 963. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members uh, for hearing Senate File 963. Uh, a legacy appropriation for the Great Lakes Aquarium in Duluth. For the past 22 years, the Great Lakes Aquarium has been delivering freshwater education which is so cool, freshwater education for our state, focused on engaging, inspiring, and encouraging stewardship of wildlife and water. Here to tell us more about the aquarium and their legacy request is Executive Director Jay Walker. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members, and thank you uh, for sharing your time with me today. Um, thank you, Senator McEwen, for your support on this bill. Uh, my name is Jay Walker. I'm the Executive Director at the Great Lakes Aquarium. Uh, you may also hear us referred to as Lake Superior Center doing business as Great Lakes Aquarium and reference to Lake Superior Center Authority, who is the state entity put in place to oversee the state's investment in our building and grounds. Um, we are proven stewards of legacy funds and have strong history of bringing science, play, wildlife, and water exploration to the public. Several of our largest projects have benefited from Legacy Arts, Culture, and Heritage Fund. 
This includes a 2014 award-winning Shipwrecks Alive exhibit that showcases Minnesota's underwater history, the 2016 Unsalted Seas exhibit that focuses on large lakes around the world and features a 9,000-gallon sturgeon touch pool. If you haven't touched a five-foot sturgeon, I do recommend it. It's a lot of fun. And then recently in 2021, we were able to open our newest award-winning exhibit, H2O Watersheds at Work. Originally allocated in 2019-2020, the project timeline was amended due to closures and work disruptions related to the COVID-19 pandemic. This splash and play exhibit encourages people to learn about the wonders of water together. Another side note, do bring an extra set of clothes. Um, legacy funding enables us to leverage significant resources com from community partners. It allows us to tell big important stories in accessible and meaningful ways. And we are grateful for your past support and for consideration of this project. The project I'm here to talk to you about today invites people to reach into the past, engage with animals and the waters of our region's ancient seas. It is a new exhibit we are calling Lava to Lakes. People have been drawn to the Great Lakes region since time immemorial for the vast opportunities the landscapes provided for people for thousands of years. Minnesota's geologic history has shaped our varied ecosystems. Thousands of lakes, both big and small, prairies, bluffs, river valleys, hills, you can likely picture some of these formations from your own home districts. In fact, the history and life on Earth itself is written in the landscape all around us. Tucked in the Minnesota River Valley near Morton are some of the oldest rocks on Earth. Shark teeth are embedded in the hills of Calumet, and fossilized algae mats lay below the boreal forests along the Gunflint. Clues about the past are scattered throughout the state. Understanding Earth systems and how they interact with us today is vital to ensuring a healthy and vibrant Minnesota. Throughout ancient history, there is evidence that modest changes to Earth systems have lasting and long-term impacts on life. For example, a billion years ago, microscopic algae introduced oxygen to the Earth's atmosphere, revolutionizing the way life could exist. These same algae are responsible for the mineral deposits of today's Iron Range, making our life possible, our modern life possible. Throughout the new Lava and Lakes Gallery, guests will engage with animals and interactives that explore these connections between land and life. Multiple pools, like our touch pools, like our jellyfish touch pool, and life-size models, including a 25-foot predatory armored fish, allow guests to reach into the past, interact with life that represents a key moment of change. The aquarium serves 10,000 pre-K through 12th grade students through field trips and programming each year. And when creating these exhibit galleries, we consider the state and national standards that may be covered by our dis displays. And when people understand the ancient patterns of our landscape, they are better equipped to address major issues such as climate change, resource management, and human safety. Our approach to these big topics is to make them accessible through hands-on experience and play. The project is slated to open in spring of 2025. The budget is $956,600. And the remainder of this project will be funded by matching and in-kind support from partners, donors, and the aquarium's operating budget. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Um, any question from member Senator Green? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, question is the same. I, I think that uh, um, this isn't your first ask from Legacy. And, and so, as I, as I recall, you're back like every year. Uh, so is this your standard ask, or is this increased, decreased? This is slightly increased um, from, from previous exhibits, but the scope is similar. Um, we've seen uh, the biggest issue we're having is the, is the, rate, is the cost increase. Um, we've seen where shipping costs have come up by 25 to 50 percent. Um, equipment costs are, 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 um, are higher as well as contract work. Um, you'll also notice in our budget that, that our, we also will be increasing the amount of money that we're developing for as well. Um, so this is, it is, a, um, it's a, it is definitely a little bit more uh, aggressive on the development side than we've had to do in the past. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you explain the development and then tell me how much more of an increase this is? Um, so Walker. we are, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, <laughs> Senator Green, I apologize. Um, the, uh, the, we have 500,000 is the request uh, split up between fiscal year 24 and 25. Um, and then the rest is the $460,600. Uh, currently we have $250,000 that we have secured. And I'm confident that the other uh, half of that will be, um, will be able to get, considering the past development that we've done um, in the next two years. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what you're telling me is that this is double the, the ask from last year? 
I didn't write quite get that. So. Oh, I'm so, sorry. I, yeah, uh, so Mr. the Walker. last, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Green, the last project that we did was the H2O exhibit, and that total um, was uh, about 650000 And um, so we had received 150000 from uh, legacy funding for that project. Thank you. And that was in 2021. Or 20, okay. I should say 2019. That was the holdover project from the uh, from the uh, pandemic. Okay, uh, Sarah McCune, any last remark? Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members, for your consideration of this request. Uh, the Great Lakes Aquarium does wonderful work in Duluth and a, is a great educational institution for our families up north. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Walker, thank you. for your testimony as well. Uh, we will lay over Senate File 963 for possible inclusion in a legacy anonymous bill. And Senator, Senator McCune, uh, you, being your vice chair, uh, you know, like we can do this all night long and we have, have more fun <laughs> in this committee within our own members. Uh, you know, if you're okay with uh, accommodating our guest member yes. uh, to maybe uh, change the order a little bit. And so, so I see Senator Klein's. Uh, it's here. Senator Friends also here too. So if Senator, if Absolutely. you can, okay. So Senator Klein, um, we'll give you the ahead order um, to present your bill. Uh, Senate, okay, Senate File 2194, Senator Klein, Dakota County Historical Society. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee, uh, and thank you for letting me jump the line. I appreciate that, Senator McCune. Uh, Senate File 2194 is an appropriation from the Legacy Fund uh, uh, to the, of $275,000 in fiscal year 2024 to the Minnesota Historical Society for a grant to the Dakota County Historical Society to upgrade and improve the Lashie Memorial Museum. I'm going to let Commissioner Atkins tell you about the delightful nature of that uh, museum, which documents the history uh, of Dakota County. Uh, and the, the funds which they are requesting this year uh, would be used to uh, upgrade the entrances and make them uh, ADA compliant, et cetera. Uh, and I do have a testifier, Mr. Chair. Welcome, and please state your name for the record. Thank uh, you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Atkins. My name is Joe Atkins. I'm a Dakota County Commissioner, and I want to try to speak as quickly as uh, Senator Klein, because I know you all are under the gun a little bit, and so is he, as far as committee time goes. Uh, I realized as I was waiting for our bill to come up that it was literally 75 years ago today that immigrants and veterans from East St. Paul, from South St. Paul, from West St. Paul, uh, went on strike for 10 weeks uh, to fight for a, what turned out to be a nine cent increase in their wages. Uh, as it turned out, that was 6%. It was actually pretty good. Uh, in order to achieve that, they were beaten with sticks and kicked. Uh, and it's, uh, it, nonetheless, it meant a lot to the families that, uh, that uh, benefited from that, uh, one of whom, that, one of those individuals was my grandfather. Um, and those are the types of stories that are preserved in the Dakota County Historical, uh, by the Dis Historical Society and in the Dis uh, Dakota County Museum. It dates back to the bicentennial, literally December of 1976. Uh, we just made a significant investment of $1.2 million to try to bring that facility up to date. Uh, mostly for accessibility and inclusiveness and diversity, things like elevators and restrooms. Uh, and quite honestly, Mr. Chairman and Senator, we ran out of money. Um, we're coming to you to, to try to, so it's about a five to one match in terms of what we're asking for. We want to finish the front, the entrance, the part that most people see. It attracts thousands of visitors each year, uh, but we think we can do even better than that. Uh, with a little help from you. Uh, so it's, it's probably the least exciting um, but most uh, most important or very vital uh, to our efforts, uh, it's things like ceiling title and monument work and, and that sort of thing that, that preserves that legacy uh, that folks like, uh, like my grandfather and so many immigrants and veterans, um, those stories that are preserved. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We're trying to stay under your five-minute time. Thank you, Commissioner Atkins. Any questions from members? Well, thank you. And History always tells us that we, we can forgive, but we cannot forget. And always good to maintain history, record them, you know, and uh, so that we don't end up making the same mistake again. So thank you for your testimony. Any closing remarks, uh, Senator Klein? Uh, thank you, Chair Hawk, her and uh, committee. I appreciate your consideration of uh, this uh, bill. Okay. We'll lay over Senate File 2194 for possible inclusion in a uh, legacy omnibus bill. 
Okay, I see Senator Fritz here as well, our uh, Chair of Energy and Environment is here. Senator Fritz, uh, Senate File 996, anytime you're ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members, for hearing Senate File 996, what we refer to as the County Fair Bill. Members, you may know that each county in Minnesota has a county agricultural society. Part of that is the empowerment to create a county fair. I believe that um, you'll find that the $400,000 requested here is a perfect application of legacy funds. Mr. Chair, those funds enable each of these county fairs to provide opportunities for musicians, artists, demonstration, cultural heritage, and history. Some geographically large counties in Minnesota actually have two fairs, Senator Hauschild, like St. Louis County. The funding supports local artists. Um, Senator Herr, I know that you like to work for those uh, who uh, are on their way up and local artists need a forum to be heard. And it's also a good cultural uh, exchange for us to have members of the community come here, local artists. History the same way, Mr. Chair. Finally, um, it's worth noting that these legacy grants have revitalized the county fairs so that if you know your county fair history, the funds that are provided allow these county fairs and these societies um, through chapter 38 of the statutes to grow and now they're a vibrant part of each county's celebration of its own cultural heritage each year. Uh, I wanna thank my co-authors, Senator Hoffman and Senator Nelson, and I do have two testifiers, Mr. Chair, and hope you would consider uh, hearing from, the first is Mr. A.J. Doerr. Okay, Mr. Doerr, welcome. Uh, state your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Andrew Doerr, and I'm here today representing the Minnesota Federation of County Affairs. And, and Mr. Chair, I, actually, I was just here to, uh, to, uh, for assistance, so if we could maybe go to Ms. Gustin first, that would be great. Okay. Is she, is she, she's online, or is she's here? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. she's Chair. online. Okay. That's, you have to turn uh, your Tiffany camera. Gustin, I believe you have to turn on online. your camera. Yep, my camera is on. Can you see me? Um, okay, there we go. Wonderful. Thank you so much. For the record, uh, my name is Tiffany Gustin, and I am the Executive Secretary of the Minnesota Federation of County Fairs, and I would like to chair, thank the Chair and the Committee for your time today. I was born and raised in Aiken County, and I have served as a Director on the Aiken County Fair. I've exhibited at the fair for as long as I can remember, uh, back to my days in 4-H, and now as an open class exhibitor. I'm the proud parent of two children who are exhibitors in the fair, and they are the fourth generation of exhibitors in my family. But as in my role, uh, having served as the Executive Secretary of the Minnesota Federation of County Fairs for the past seven years that I appear in front of you today. As was stated, the Minnesota Federation of County Fairs uh, represents all counties across the state of Minnesota. And I'm here today to ask for your support for Senate File 996, which appropriates 400,000 per year to grants for county fairs to enhance arts access and education and to preserve and promote Minnesota's history and cultural heritage. I will note that this is the same amount that was granted by the legislature in the 2021 legacy bill. I would like to express my thanks to the authors for supporting this bill as well. In many parts of the state of Minnesota, especially in the rural areas, access to arts and cultural exhibits is limited and even a rarity. These dollars allow county fairs to bring arts and culture into the far corners of the state, providing convenient and in many cases free access to opportunities that would not be otherwise available if not for these funds. As you know, the challenge to opening people's minds who think and look differently from, them, from themselves is the challenge of getting those individuals to the table. By providing the arts and cultural opportunities at county fairs, you are reaching a demographic that may not spend a Saturday in a museum. I fully understand that budgeting and legislating is about choices, and it's about setting priorities. And I am appearing before you today because an investment of 400,000 per year is money well spent. By appropriating these funds to Minnesota's county fairs, you will be empowering fairs to provide a unique, affordable, and convenient opportunity to all Minnesotans to access legacy programs. I am hard pressed to think of a way that legacy funds could be allocated that would touch a higher cross section of Minnesota citizens of all ages than county fairs. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you today. In honor of your time, I will end my comments, but I would be happy to stand for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Gustin. Question from members? Okay. 
Sorry, Hoffman, hello. Uh, yep. uh, Senator Friends, any uh, last uh, remarks on this bill? Well, my first remark would be thank you, Mr. Chair. I know you have a lot of worthy uh, presentations today, and I appreciate the time, and I know your committee is very busy. I would just uh, say to each member, I'm sure you've been to your own county fairs. My county fair is Nicollet County. It's not the biggest. It's not the fanciest, but it is free. Um, we work the ag exhibits. We have a racetrack, and we have a lot of kids running around laughing. And to the testifier's point, this is an opportunity for funding to provide continued opportunities, whatever part of Minnesota you're from. And I hope you'll consider it favorably as you make your decisions on legacy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Friends and uh, Mr. Doerr and Ms. Gustin for your testimony. We'll lay over Senate File 996 for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. Okay, next on, we're changing order a little bit right here. Uh, we see Senator Uma Verbatim's here. I uh, want to call her to present Senate File 1581. Anytime you're ready, Senator Uma Verbatim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's great to be in your committee for the first time. Yeah, um, I am here today with um, folks from Como Park Zoo and Conservatory, um, which has been celebrated as the most visited cultural attraction in Minnesota, with as many as 2.2 million visitors per year, and it's in my district. Um, Como is free to visit, which we're very proud of. It's inclusive, it provides access to all, and whether it's creating fun experiences that deepen knowledge and a sense of connection or making sure that it's easy and welcoming for all people to visit, Como is just always inviting, always inspiring. Um, Como visitors comes come from all over the state, about 16% from just St. Paul, 42% from the metro, 22% from greater Minnesota, and about 16% from out of state. The arts and cultural uh, heritage funds have allowed Como to meet the growing needs of the 21st century audience while preserving the historical character that visitors value. And in addition, the funds have been leveraged with private support through Como Friends, the nonprofit partner of, of Como Zoo. Uh, programs that feature Como in the community and residency program, um, public engagement events that include little explorers, senior strolls, sensory friendly days, special exhibits, garden preservation, habitat renewal, and music and nature series. These programs really inspire learning with all of the wonders of the natural world. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce Michelle Furr, our director of uh, the Como Park Zoo and Conservatory, who can share more details about the project. Welcome, and please state your name for the record. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Michelle Fur, and I am the director at Como Park Zoo and Conservatory. And I have a little bit of the Marjorie McNeely Conservatory with me just to give us a little punch of spring on a day like today. This is the final week of our spring flower, or our winter flower show, and our spring flower show will be opening up next week. And it's also a little recognition of our senator's birthday today, so thank you for letting her come up a little bit early. There is a treasure in Minnesota's backyard, a world-class habitat in the state of, our Minnesota, state of Minnesota. Como Park Zoo and Conservatory is owned by all, enjoyed by all, and is free for all. There are very few places like it anywhere else. At Como, we see our work as one part love, one part responsibility, and always a joy to share. For over a century, we've been a fun, conveniently located, and budget-friendly alternative but we're so much more. We are driven by a powerful mission to inspire our public to value the presence of living things. And as mentioned, our visitorship has been over 2 million annual visitors, and with our reach, with over 400,000 of those guests coming from greater Minnesota and 16% coming from the tourist market, contributes to our economic impact of over 162 million per year. Now, not only is Como free, we attract a very diverse audience racially, economically, and geographically, and we are inclusive and provide access to all, whether it's creating those fun experiencing experiences or just those educational aspects or that connection to the animals and plants. And we inspire learning. We invite everyone to share our love for the plants and animals so that together we can protect them and keep them healthy and keep them flourishing, those in our care and around the world. And Como has been a proud recipient of past legacy funding and has proven to be a good steward of these statewide resources. These programs that we have been able to do under the legacy umbrella have, would not exist without these funds. And we have been able to provide programming focusing on all Minnesotans, which includes our sensory friendly days where we open up early and provide access and, 
and tools for those who are living on the spectrum and their families. Our senior strolls, which is an opportunity for guests to come in a little early or stay a little late. Our sign language days, where all of our programming is signed with ALS interpreters. During COVID, we pivoted and did some virtual programs with Adventures with Ashley, who is here in the audience, as well as Como Live and now Como Cares episodes. And just like this morning, our little Explorer series happens for our preschool programming for our youngest guests. This last biennium, we launched a pilot apprentice program where young people can get paid for working experiences through currently the St. Paul's Youth Employment Program, Right Track. And our legacy supports the career development program to support those activities. There are many barriers for professional jobs in zookeeping and horticulture, including multiple unpaid internships in several markets. Our graduates will meet minimum qualifications for zookeepers in most jobs in the AZA or the Association of Zoos and Aquarium field. We've been able to marry the arts in our programming from weekly seasonal music series with over 60,000 attendees featuring over 60 artists, or last summer, the Summer of Sparky, where we had over 140 artists apply to be juried to design our paint 20 different Sparky statues, which are the iconic um, feature at Como, and they were placed around Minnesota all summer long. We've been able to focus on special exhibits featuring traveling art showcases, butterflies, pollinators, partnering with some of our other cultural institutions like the Bell Museum, and this summer an interactive mace called Mission Safari. Our initiatives have included garden preservation in our century old public gardens at the Marjorie McNeely Conservatory and habitat renewal, building on our successful private public partnership with our nonprofit Park Como Friends, updating our aquatics animals area and our interactive interpretation. So as I wrap up, I wanna say thank you. I, as I mentioned, these programs would not exist today or will exist without the Arts and Cultural Heritage Legacy Funds. So thank you for your past support and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Fear. Any question from Senator Green? Thank you, Ms. Chair. This is the same question. I'm trying to remember and I, uh, what, what the past uh, appropriation was because uh, the zoo also comes in every biennium for, for money. And this seems a little high, too. So you're looking at $3.5 million. What was the previous ask? Ms. 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 Fuhrer. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, in the, the last biennium, we received $1.5 million per year. And this year, we're asking for one75 And for this is for us to ex continue to expand the programming that we're already doing and the reach for the more reach within the state of Minnesota to reach those audiences. I think we've proven to be a really good steward of those funds and be able to be really successful and, and proactive in the pro programs that we've been able to accomplish. Okay. All right. For the discussion, we're good. Uh, any um, last comment from Senator Umu Verbenum? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, live in a Como neighborhood, so I just wanted to say that Como Park Zoo and Conservatory is like literally a treasure in my backyard, um, where I love spending time. It's where we go walk our dog, um, go visit the zoo, and all the programming that happens is just really fun to see, especially in the summertime, all the kids in the neighborhood who are there, they do a great job. So I hope the committee um, will consider this as you put together the omnibus. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Ms. Ver, for bringing bring the flower too, and happy birthday. And for that, we'll, <laughs> we'll uh, lay uh, Senator Fowl 1581 for possible inclusion in, in on, our omnibus legacy bill. Okay. Uh, Next on the agenda, I'd like to call um, one of our members here, Senator Green. Are you, 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 got, you have a bill? Uh, Senator File 876. Yeah, and while you're grabbing, I, I want to prompt members to a, ask, ask all the questions you can on, on his bill. <laughs> <laughs> Especially Senator Wiesemer. Anytime you're ready, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I should have had some testifiers here, but I don't see them, so I'll muddle through this myself if I can. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, according here, okay. you have uh, Ms. Uh, Kingery and Mr. Hanto Show. Are they here? Oh, I guess they're on Zoom, they're so on they Zoom. should be here. Okay. But just to, just to give a little introduction, uh, Senate File 876 is also 
uh, uh, request that comes back every two years. This is for uh, the River Watch, uh, Red River Watch uh, Watershed Board, and it uh, it funds the River Watch. And what it does, it gets school kids out and actually teaches them how to test for uh, different chemicals in the water. Um, uh, it's uh, one of the few programs that I do like uh, because it does it does allow the children to get out and uh, actually experience not just not just nature but also what you do. Uh, how important the water is and how to test the water. But the testifiers are uh, ready to go and I think they can explain it better than I can. Okay, on to the testifier. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may uh, proceed. Hi, uh, my name for the record is Asher Kingery. <clears throat> Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Asher Kingery and I'm here on behalf of the International Water Institute. I will give a brief summary of our programming and then introduce one of our River Watch advisors and a River Watch student. We provide watershed education across the Red River Basin and just celebrated our 28th consecutive year of gathering students and teachers around the subjects of water quality, watersheds, and the Red River Basin. There are two separate programs involved in this funding request. River Watch is a program for grades 7 through 12 which engages students in their watershed through hands-on field science exploring their river and documenting conditions, and annually presenting research at the River Watch Forum. Some students are in this program for several years, while other schools fit it into an ecology or an environmental science curriculum. River of Greens is a second program and engages fifth graders in the connectivity of our water and, our, and how watersheds function. Interactive classroom visits and online mapping allow students to see where their water goes and where it comes from. This program reaches entire grade levels in communities and allows students to use geography, reading, writing, science, and art in the process of better understanding their watershed in our state. I want to thank you for your time and consideration, and I ask for your support of the Red River Basin Riverwatch program. Now I'd like to introduce Hunter Scow, a Riverwatch advisor at Norman County East High School, and Chloe Abraham, a Riverwatch student also from Norman County East. And Mr. Chair, just to note that Chloe is late after school and it is also her birthday today. Mm -hmm. Hello Thank Chairman you. and members of the committee. My name is Hunter Scow and I teach 7th through 12th grade science at Norman County East School. This is my fourth year as a Riverwatch advisor. Riverwatch is an excellent opportunity for students to experience and learn about science in action using their local watershed and the Red River Basin as the focus for their learning. It is designed to have students learn practical applications of a variety of topics related to resource management, conservation, chemistry, and statistics. But these topics are not taught with lectures and textbooks. Instead, the students learn by participating in a variety of hands-on activities. This year, my team participated in most of the Riverwatch um, offerings, and they've enjoyed and learned from every activity. In July, we went kayaking on the Wild Rice River, the students love this event. I even had seniors that graduated last May return to participate and one student from another district joined. Um, in September, we went to macro invertebrate sampling and water quality sampling. The students were shocked to see the number and variety of insects that live in the water. New members also learned how to use data collection tools and record scientific data. In October, we went to the fall kickoff event where the students learned more about data collection and analysis and went canoeing. From November through February, the students worked on the yearly forum competition. This year, the team performed a historical data analysis of the water quality for their local watershed. For many members on my team, this statistical analysis was a challenge and they rose to meet it. On March 1st, my team was snowed in and could not attend the forum event in person. So our team met on Google Meets in order to present their forum project. This spring, the team will also attend a board meeting of our local watershed district to present what they have done this year. Once snow melts, we look forward to getting back on the water to complete more water quality data collection trips. Through all of these activities, the students have learned an enormous amount of scientific concepts as well as many skills. They have learned how to communicate difficult information, use a variety of scientific tools, kayak and canoe, and so much more. This program is one of the few extracurricular opportunities my students have to explore nature and experience science in action. 
I ask for your support of the Red River Basin River Watch program. Thank you for your time and consideration. And I will turn it over to Chloe. Hello, Chairman and members of the committee. I am Chloe Abraham and I'm a junior. I've been involved in River Watch for two years now. I enjoy River Watch because I like to learn about and educate others on why the health of our waterways is important and how it can affect other things, including the, the animals in our community and the activities we can do on our waterways. I also really enjoy going on sampling trips and meeting a bunch of new people through River Watch. As a captain of our team this year, I put a lot of time and work into our former project, so it was really exciting and fun to receive a silver rating on it. My favorite activities we do in River Watch is the day-long kayaking trip we do on our local river. It's a fun day of kayaking and observing the wildlife that is present in our community. I ask for your support in the Red River Basin River Watch program. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Thank Ab you, Ms. Abraham, and um, Mrs. Showen and Ms. Kingery for your testimony. Um, and question from members to the testifier and also Senator Green. Or Senator Green, you want to question your, yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do, in fact. I, uh, and, and so because I always ask the question, uh, the what, what increase is there? I think it's important to know. And there is a slight increase here. I think, uh, I, th I thought it was uh, 25,000, but it sounds like it might be a little more closer to 50, but it's a small increase uh, for what they do with the money. I think the, this small amount of money is well worth the, the time to put into the bill. So I hope you consider it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, we, with that, and I think I heard a little bit that there was some, someone's birthday too. I didn't, who was it, but my- It was one of the testifiers. One of the testifiers, yeah. Ms. Abraham, I suppose. Um, so with that, we want to uh, um, lay over Senate File 876 uh, for possible inclusion in the Legacy Autobus Bill. Thank you. Okay, Senator. Okay. Senator Eric, are you you here? Right. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll take your bill first. Senator Eric on Senate House 1977. Sandstone appropriation. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members. This is not asking for a new appropriation. This is asking for an extension on the timeline to use uh, an appropriation from the past and. Um, I would uh, be willing to turn it over to the city administrator from Sandstone if she is online to, to explain the need for the extension. Okay, Ms. Kathy George, uh, if you're online, please uh, turn your mic and your visual on and yep, we'll spot you. Okay, good. Uh, introduce yourself for the record and you may uh, proceed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, committee members. Thank you, Senator Rarick, for introducing this item. So the city received two legacy grants for our uh, historic Robinson Quarry Park. And um, we're very thankful for that. We uh, took quite a bit of time. It took to do the plans and specifications, working with uh, an engineering team, design team, and doing the cultural landscape report work. And, um, and then, uh, involving members of the community uh, and our park and rec mission. So there was a lot of involvement in creating the plans for this project. When we went out to bid it, um, it, uh, it came in, we only got two bids and they came in over $2 million over our budget, which was just unsustainable. So we had to go back to the drawing board, reevaluate our scope, um, change things around and uh, re-bid the project again, which we did just recently. We got seven bids, which is fantastic. And we, um, the council would like to move forward with the low bid and a couple of alternatives that will fit within our budget just perfectly. And the contractor would be able to get started this spring. And we anticipate the project to finish this fall but 
right now the phase one project, the first grant we received, uh, the deadline is June 30th of 2023. We're not going to be able to meet that deadline. Um, and so we're asking for an extension to June 30th of 2025, although we don't feel like it's going to go that long. We just would like to be sure since we don't want to have to come back for um, this process. If something does come up and there are delays, um, can't get certain materials or items or anything of that sort that uh, we're running into these days. So thank you very much for your consideration. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, any question from members to Ms. George or Ms. Senator Rarick? Seth Hoffman? So this is just, it sounds to me, Senator, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Rick, that this just, you're ex you want to extend the date so that the, we don't lose the, the process, the, the progress that we've gotten so far. Is that correct, Senator? Senator Rick? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, correct. Like, um, because the initial bid came in too high, they had to go through the entire process again, which took a, a longer than expected as well. Um, so instead of getting right to the project, um, they've been trying to plan, get it all set. And so now the timeline expires on them. So they're just asking for that extension. There could be some weather delays, as um, Ms. George said, some material delays. They just want to make sure they can get everything uh, and get the, the project done. Uh, but it's, it's not asking for any new money, just an extension of a, an existing uh, funds. So, Mr. Chair, if I may ask, is it is this Senator something Hoffman. you're going to lay this over? Does that are the timelines that tight? You you would probably lay this over in some omnibus bill. Is that correct? Right. You know, why not send it to the floor? Like I like sending stuff to the floor. You know, I don't know. I mean, is it are we that tight of timeline, Senator Rarick, on that? Uh, nice Rarick, tie, by the what way. What we'd like to have, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Hoffman. I believe you know. Right now, the current deadline is June thirtieth. Okay. Um, so it's it's not that tight. So Thanks it could be part of the omnibus. So thank you though for that question. Okay. Good good option, but we'll we'll stick with the plan here, and we'll be able to help. And hopefully, um, you can get the project done by uh, June thirtieth, twenty twenty five. So thank thank any any uh, last remark, uh, Senator Eric? Uh Mr. Chair, we just uh, appreciate the consideration for this request. Thank you. Okay. Now we lay Senate file 1977 for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. And thank you, Ms. George. Okay. Um, where is he? Hoffman, uh, you ready? You, you ready for your bill? Okay. So Hoffman, 2501, and thank you for asking for my well-being for the last two days. You know. Uh, I'm glad you're better, Senator. This is uh, now it's snowing out, so. So anytime you're ready, Senator. Mr. Chair and members, thank you. Um, uh, I, I handed out some little buttons for you. Treat people like people. That's uh, something that uh, the Minnesota Governor's uh, Council on Developmental Disabilities um, does. And, and that's just, that just a small little thing. What they really do is this. And the DD Act that was signed into law federally by a wonderful um, Senator Dave Durenberger and Senator Tom Harkin, I believe, and uh, were ones that really established that. But, but specifically, I could go into the history and the depth of why the Governor's DD Council, what it means to not only Minnesota, but every other state in the, in the, in the union. But, but we're here, Senate File 2501. This just provides simple funding to the Governor's Council uh, to continue its archiving work of developmental disabilities history in Minnesota. And um, the council received legacy funding in 2017 for $55,000, and this request will, will build upon that work. Minnesota has a proud history 
uh, of helping people with developmental disabilities in its bipartisan history that includes Governor Luther Youngdahl to Senator Dave Durenberger and Vice President Hubert, Fun Hubert Humphrey to, to Governor Purpich. The council has captured individual stories, and it's actually go to the Minnesota, the DD Council website, and there's legislative achievements, executive branch initiatives, and reports that date back to the founding of the state. Um, I served as the chair of the council for four years. Actually, it was longer than that, and that was years ago. And I can assure everyone on this committee, man, this funding is well spent. And I want to tell you a story, um, Mr. Chair. When I spent my three years, 2001 to 2004, as a member of the Federal Interagency Coordinating Council during the Bush administration, the first presentation we went to, there was, there was a, an individual from the Department of Human Services federally who was talking about this wonderful um, woman uh, from Minnesota named Dr. Colleen Wick who established the Partners in Policy Making program and has, uh, they were just, they were singing accolades, not only that, but also about the fact of how Minnesota had uh, on their, uh, in their prize, the history of disability. And there was other states that were tapping into that. And, and I just, you know, a light bulb went off and I immediately wanted to come back and, and uh, uh, meet Dr. Colleen Wick, and I'm glad I did. And she's sitting next to me, Dr. Colleen Wick, Mr. Chair. Well, honored to have you here, Ms. Wick. And Thank so, you. Uh, please uh, introduce your name for the record to, to before you. Yep, go ahead. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Colleen Wick, and I am the Executive Director of the Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities, and we're a governor-appointed, federally funded, 25-member council, and 60% of our membership are people with developmental disabilities or their families. We are requesting $100,000 in heritage legacy funding to preserve and raise awareness of the history of developmental disabilities. And in 2000, we created um, an entire section called With an Eye to the Past. And that documented our history all the way back to the founding of the state and brought us to the year 2000. And then in 2017, we received $55,000 in legacy funding and we created With an Eye to the Future. And that brought us all the way to from 2000 to 2015. In the last five years, we've had 12 million downloaded publications from our website and over 267,000 video views of these historical videos. And so we're requesting funding to keep our work going by uh, indexing additional videos and by converting boxes of historical records to an online presence. And so thank you very much for considering this request, and thank you, Senator Hoffman, for everything you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have another test five, Ms. Baer? Or no, uh, Mr. Chair and members, Julie Byrell is Byron. the legislative director under the Department of Administration. You probably remember her, because 10 years ago she worked with your CA and worked with us, actually, uh, over here in the Senate. So, But if you want her to come up to the table, you're the chair. You can call anybody up to the table. You know that. Right? Yeah. Um, only if she wants. Where's she? No, okay, <laughs> she's fine. She's fine. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, well, any questions from members? Any uh, closing comments, Senator Hoffman? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would I would really um, encourage folks to go take a look at Minnesota, the Governor's DD Council, of that Minnesota, and what Dr. Wick has done, and um, and the things that the the priceless work that Dr. Colleen Wick has done for the state of Minnesota goes back to when uh, we had state institutions. And um, she was brought forth to help um, fix them. And she really did help fix them because really that's when you started hearing about um, person-centered, informed choice. Dr. Wick has been uh, not only a, a leader among uh, our state, but I can tell you uh, internationally, and it's, uh, it's a treasure to have Dr. Wick, and she's not going to like that I'm saying this, but you know what? Um, you gotta, you got to know what you know in Minnesota. So please check out the website and really look at There's a story of Hadamar that they put together that really uh, formulates just what happened during World War II, and that's, um, 
you know, uh, it's worthy that we must remember what happened in the past so that we don't recreate the future in front of us. And so uh, with that, Senator, uh, Mr. Chair and, and members, I appreciate you hearing this bill and laying it over. So thank you. Okay. Well, honored to have you here, Dr. Wake and Senator Hoffman, for carrying uh, bills that, you know, open our eyes and opportunity uh, for our uh, disability community um, in terms of empowerment as well. So we will lay over Senate File 2501 for possible inclusion in a legacy omnibus bill. Okay, Senator Morrison. Okay, next is um, Senator McCabe Quay's bill, uh, Senate File 446. Um, Senator Morrison is co-author of the bill. Um, Minnesota Zoological Garden. Anytime you're ready, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I am pleased to um, present for your consideration Senate File 446 um, in Senator Makeway's absence tonight. Um, the legacy amendment dollars are hard at work at the Minnesota Zoo. Um, as this is, these are D Senator Makeway's um, notes, so I'm just going to read them directly. Although located in my district, I am proud of the Minnesota Zoo's statewide approach, outreach. Today you'll hear from Director Frawley about how the Minnesota Zoo uses arts and cultural heritage funding to serve all of Minnesota in ways that are uniquely Minnesota Zoo. Many of these offerings are value adds to the guest experience, meaning they're included with zoo admission. With legacy funding, the zoo is expanding its demographic outreach and becoming a more inclusive destination, which will be further illustrated in Director Frawley's testimony. Thank you for your ongoing support, and with that, I will turn it over to um, uh, Director Frawley, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. It's always okay. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Uh, Frawley, and again, state your name for the record. Yes, Mr. Chair, committee members, John Frawley, Director of the Minnesota Zoo, thank you for the time today, and thank you, Senator Morrison, for that introduction and support. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, you, as you know, the Minnesota Zoo is one of the fifth largest zoos in the country here in Minnesota, almost 500 acres, reaching Historically, over 1.3 to 1.4 million visitors per year, um, over 40,000 households. So we are a, a big zoo, and uh, we have been fortunate enough to receive yearly um, legacy support to um, enhance and make those our offerings even better than we're able to do normally. So today I'd like to go ahead and offer a little bit of uh, examples of how the Minnesota Zoo has historically used our legacy support. Uh, they, it really comes in three areas. One, to create human and animal connections. Two, to provide more access and statewide outreach, and also more educational programming. And three, we use legacy funds to expand the ways we serve Minnesota, specifically through the lens of the diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And to give the committee a little bit of uh, examples of those three areas, with animal connections, a lot of people realize we have a beautiful Wells Fargo family farm at the zoo. Minnesota has a rich farming history. Uh, these funds allow us to keep that fun, that zoo uh, experience, that Minnesota farm experience open later in the fall and earlier in the spring, so expanding the hours of that farm. Um, legacy funds have also helped us travel throughout Minnesota and bringing the Minnesota Zoo to people who can't come to the zoo. Those who are maybe in hospitals or nursing homes or classrooms that don't have the resources to come to the zoo. Uh, these funds allow us to go out and serve Minnesota in their own towns. Um, the Legacy Fund has also allowed uh, us to, um, uh, you know, do more on access and inclusion and um, advance the work of DIA at the zoo um, so that we at the zoo align with the one Minnesota Council. Um, so a lot of great work. On access and outreach, we also have been able to use legacy funds to create maps of the zoo for visitors in 11 different languages. We've also created an app for families with special needs, specifically apps for autism, uh, that makes the experience much better for families as they visit our zoo. Um, and then in the areas of new exhibits and events and arts, 
legacy funds have helped us create new educational exhibits, such as dino experiences or bringing Llama Trek to the Minnesota Zoo, showcasing uh, South America. All of these exhibits are uh, free with admission to the zoo. So um, the last thing I'd just point out is the legacy funds over the years have also allowed us to bring new types of events to the zoo. Recently, we brought Jack Lantern Spectacular, an artistic exhibit that brought over 133,000 Minnesotans to the zoo to, to look at artistically carved pumpkins. And then we also are launching uh, events this summer, Wild Nights, which is a, a festival featuring live music artisans and vendors from all over Minnesota that can showcase their music, their art, and their wares at the Minnesota Zoo. Uh, all of this through the lens of uh, DEIA. So with that, Mr. Chair and committee members, um, our request this year um, for the 23 requests is $4 million, $2 million per biennium. Uh, the request is the same as the current year, and we are requesting no increases. So Mr. Chair, with that, I'd entertain any questions. Okay, any questions uh, to Director Farley, Farley of Minnesota Zoo or Senator Morrison? Uh, Senator Wiesmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What's your favorite animal there? <laughs> Mr. Chair, committee members, number one question I get in my life is that question. <laughs> And it's very political. I, I always answer my favorite animal is a healthy animal. There you go. So uh, <laughs> I, if, I think my zookeepers would have a problem if I said one or the other. So. You love all your children. Please. Exactly. <laughs> like your children, Mr. Chair. Good, good answer there, Director uh, Frawley. Good answer there. Any, any further discussion? Well, uh, Sarah Morrison, um, closing comment. I just think, Mr. Chair, the zoo is uh, really a, a jewel in our state, and I thank you for your consideration. Okay. We'll lay over Senate file 446 for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. Next on in our order, uh, oh, Senator Dibble, are you, are you here? Okay. Oh, right there behind your chair. <laughs> I can see you. Senator Dibble. Okay, Senator Devil, 2870. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. It is my uh, pleasure and honor to uh, be able to present and discuss Senate file number 2870. Let me first uh, also start by thanking my co-authors, Senator Swadzinski, Senator Kunish, and Senator Pappas. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Senate file 2870 um, would provide support for the Bakken Museum, uh, which is located in my district on the Bonnie western shores of Bidet Makaska. <laughs> it was founded in 1975 by Earl Bakken, who invented the external pacemaker, and he was the co-founder of Medtronic. He is a tremendous innovator in our community. And for those who are not familiar with the Bakken Museum, it is a uh, STEM based museum, uh, inquiry based. It's an educational and cultural institution. And uh, for those who might have driven past it and looked over and wondered what that curious mansion is over there that looks like it might be a public building, that's the, the Bakken. Uh, for many years, Mr. Chair, it was just kind of a mansion set off behind a, a large expanse and um, had some, some signage, but it was a you know, somewhat uh, curious institution that maybe people didn't quite understand. I can tell you that in recent years, it has really come into its own. They've just gotten through a major capital campaign and a really exciting renovation and have really opened up the front of the building and it's uh, become a real vital and vibrant institution in our community, very inviting uh, with a lot of, of uh, uh, exciting enhancements. The Bakken Museum inspires a passion for innovation by exploring the potential for science, technology, and the humanities to make the world a better place. It has a forward-thinking vision to build community at the intersection of science, technology, health, and wellness, and leverages the past to inspire the next generation of innovators to transform the future. 
Um, if you haven't been there, it's really fun. It has a world-renowned collection of artifacts, which are right there, as I said, at the intersection of life sciences, electricity, and wellness. Uh, it really uh, engages children uh, by helping them explore the wonders of innovation, plant medicine, technology, science. It has out in front of it the fantastic restored wetlands. It has a green roof on top. Uh, and it has the Florence Bakken Medicinal Garden. And they reach over 40,000 people a year through their programs, both within the museum and through outreach. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to introduce my fellow testifiers from the museum, Alyssa Light, the president and CEO, and Alex Askew, director of development. OK, go ahead, uh, Ms. Light, and uh, introduce your, your, your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Alyssa Light. It's a privilege to be with you this evening, and thank you, Senator Dibble. As Senator Dibble described, the Bakken Museum builds on a rich history from our founder, Earl Bakken, as well as the state of Minnesota as a beacon and incubator of innovation. Today, the museum's purpose is to awaken the innovator inside of each of us. We do that through community-centered STEM education and outreach programs in schools crisscrossing the state, interactive museum exhibits, a maker space, and an internationally recognized artifact and book collection. We are focused on designing inclusive and accessible programs and experiences that inspire engagement with STEM and innovation. And just to illustrate an example of what that looks like in our museum, our artifact and book collection includes a first edition Frankenstein that doesn't have author Mary Shelley's name on it. It's an amazing piece of history for people to see and imagine. But we don't stop there. We designed an immersive exhibit that illustrates Mary's story as a young teen girl in the early 1800s, writing about medical ethics and humanity. And then we invite you to consider the medical ethics of the story of Frankenstein, to dive into complexity, to learn about the fringe medical innovations of the time, and how that context might have inspired a teenage girl to write the story of Frankenstein. And then we take Earl Bakken off the pedestal and invite you to remember him as an eight-year-old tinkerer growing up in Columbia Heights, sneaking into the Heights Theater to see Frankenstein for the first time, an experience that informed his love of electricity and medicine, and to which he credits as the root for his invention of the external pacemaker. Beyond the story of Earl and Mary and Frankenstein, we design exhibits that highlight today's innovators, like Minnesotan Fatima Hussein's innovation of the sports hijab and the rapid advancement of 3D printing and prosthesis innovation, plant medicine, and environmental sustainability. The Bakken Museum is working in systems change, driving a future of innovation that not only better represents our diverse, intersectional, and brilliant communities, but in so doing helps to uplift the solutions we hold for the complex problems and tremendous opportunities we face as a society. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my exceptional colleague, Alex, to provide some additional context on our community programs and equity work. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Alex Askew, and I serve as the Development Director at the Bakken Museum. Equity is an, is an institutional value that we address in every decision that we make. Whether it's centering relevant and diverse cultural references in our exhibitions, the development of multilingual exhibit panels, or ensuring that our museum spaces are accessible, both financially and physically, to all folks. My responsibility as the Director of Development is to raise diversified contributed funding streams to center this value. Devotion of resources towards this initiative is a key component of our long-term strategic plan, and it is demanded of us by our mission and our vision. The Bakken Museum has a track record of delivering high-impact, equity-driven exhibits and programming in our museum, but we're also well-known for reaching young folks in their own communities across the state with education residencies and programming in over 150 different public schools, libraries, and community centers. We've been from Rochester to Blaine, from Red Lake to Forest Lake, and Worthington to Wilmer and beyond. <coughs> In 2022, grappling still with pandemic restrictions, we were able to serve over 40,000 youth, families, and adults across 43 counties in Minnesota. We know that 50% of the young people we serve are kids of color, and 51% qualify for free or reduced lunch. This allocation of funding will directly impact the delivery of our arts, cultural, and science-related programming, 
as well as exhibits and experiences within our walls. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee, for allowing us the opportunity to speak on this important bill. Thank you. Any question from members? Uh, Sarah Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I just want to give a resounding um, recommendation for this bill. Uh, as a teacher, uh, there were many, many years that our students went to visit the Bakken Museum, and it was really a highlight for them. Uh, there, were, there were some students that were reluctant to go because maybe science and electricity was not their, you know, was not their thing, but when they would return from um, that museum, they had so much excitement, they had so much to talk about, and it really did, in a lot of ways, spur um, more of an interest in 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 the things that were are offered at the Bakken Museum, and it's in a location that a lot of kids never get to, and they don't even know that a building, if you ever see it, it doesn't necessarily look like a museum, but here it is, tucked in um, to one of the most beautiful neighborhoods in our in our community. So, um, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you've done for a, a, a long, long time. In fact. One of my um, library assistants um, worked there for for a while, and I think at one point he, he was like, should I go there? Should I stay here? What should I do? Um, so thank you again for all of the resources that you provide to our students. Thank you, Sarah Kujesh. Okay. Um, no further questions. So Sarah Dibble, uh, any last re uh, remark on this bill? Thank you. Um, I couldn't say it any better than Senator Kunish. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with what I would call the old uh, Bakken Museum of Electricity, um, which was a you know kind of a curious, odd little place, um, and uh, but really fun once you got there because of all of the really cool electrical gizmos and gadgets and machines. It still has all of those things, but it's added so much more to their programming and to their exhibits and their interactivity. Um, you know, the physical changes with the capital campaign has really opened it up uh, and made it much, much more inviting and much more accessible. And then the programs that they have, uh, taking all of that uh, excitement around innovation and experimentation um, and invention uh, to young people across the state um, has really advanced this institution very, very worthy of the support that this bill might offer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you for good tes testimony. I did, it did um, excite me a little bit to, uh, again, visit the Bakken Museum. Uh, just, just, that, just your mention of Frankenstein, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's, moving on, uh, we will, we, we will, um, Lay over, over Senate File 2870 for possible inclusion in the legacy anonymous bill. And uh, next, we this is this is our the line for our next um, three bills. Uh, we call Senator Mahama first, um, and then Senator Corin. Corin, I saw Senator Corin just walk in, so you'll be next. Um, Senator uh, Mahama's bill. Um, does has not have a has not have a Senate number yet. It's been draft. There are a few bill that's been draft and probably been draft. Um, you know how congested are uh, at the right revisor office on bill, so it hasn't come out yet. But uh, we put a place for holder here to hear Senator Muhammad's bill on Somali artifacts and cultural museum. So, um, Senator Muhammad, please uh, go ahead and uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee. It has been a long afternoon, so thank you for holding this hearing. Um, we don't have a Senate file number yet because the revisor's office is backed up. Nonetheless, I appreciate you for giving this a hearing. Um, Somali Artifact and Cultural Museum, also operating as Somali Museum of Minnesota, is, uh, this is, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to present this legacy proposal to expand access and educational opportunities to the Somali Artifact and Cultural Museum. Mr. Osman Ali, who is the Executive Director of the, of the Somali Museum, will testify today as he has worked tirelessly to collect and preserve historical and cultural artifacts from Somalia. 
This work could not be more urgent because the civil war in Somalia resulted in the loss of all, of all museums in the country, leaving no place where Somali culture and history could be studied and displayed. Mr. Ali has an impressive collection, which is currently housed in a basement off of, uh, 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 which is currently housed in a basement office in uh, on Lake Street in South Minneapolis. There, and this is not a good uh, space and or place to to hold these uh, a lot of these um, artifacts. So um, he uses the the Minnesota History of Museum, where most of the valuable pieces are at. But a new permanent home for the museum is being planned on a property held by Augsburg University on Franklin, Franklin Avenue in South Minneapolis. This proposal today will expand access to these artifacts so that students and all Minnesotans can learn about and understand Somali culture. Um, you all, all the members have gotten the due diligence materials that have been provided to all of you, um, which will showcase the good work that the museum has been doing. And um, I'm gonna give my testifier some time to talk about the work that he's been doing, but thank you. And I, as a young Somali American woman, this is obviously something that is really important to me to, to make sure that we continue to preserve the culture and history of my people. Thank you, uh, Sarah Muhammad and uh, Mr. Osman Ali. Welcome. Uh, please state your name for the record, and you may go ahead. Thank you, Senator uh, Zainab Muhammad. And thanks, Mr. Chair, for giving me this opportunity to testify the appropriate legislative bill. And thanks to all the committee members. Their committee. We are asking dollar of money, one million for the year of 2024, and one million for the year 2025. The Somali Museum's goal is to celebrate, preserve, and advance the Somali culture art within the Somali American community, and build understanding and relationship between Somalis and non-Somalis as well as across different generations. Over the past eight years of programming, we present and shared Somali culture programs with different communities and neighborhoods across the state. These programs include dance class and performance of 70 to 90 students of youth always every week perform from all, comes from all around Minnesota counties. Finger weaving classes, Somali Culture 101, traveling exhibit with artifacts, kids storytelling, exhibits around the state, book fair for the youth, poets programs. Somali Culture events once every year, audience from over 1,500 attends every year in that event. 80% of them, they are youth. They celebrate for their culture that night. Arts and cultural community celebration. We hosted this year, March 5th, over 200 from 18 different communities attended. We shared the different cultures, dance, music, and food to gather the communities will build a good relationship between them and more understanding. In order to maintain all these programs, we need to increase our capacity of our staff, space, programs, and, full, and, and fill the gap that disabled us to fulfill all the requests that the community needs. Without getting the legacy funding we requested, we will be disabled from a lot of activities because of lack of funding. We are sharing all these programs in daily basis with neighborhood communities, public and charter schools in Minnesota, general public, government sectors, hospitals, and many more. We are moving now from our space to Midtown Global Market, which is the rent is gonna go 
almost around 74,000 a year. Because of limited space, we couldn't able to help the communities that's coming from all around the world and coming to the museum to see the culture and the history of Somalia and the East Africans. If you go to meet Minneapolis, you're gonna see one of the places that they, you know, they prefer to visit is the Somali Museum of Minnesota. We're doing all this just to help and work with different communities and the youth. I hope you evaluate our request and consider it. Without you guys, we will never exceed the point we are now, and we are waiting for your help. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Ali. Any question from members? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to either the, the author or the testifiers, I, I apologize. I don't have the bill. I, I thought I had it here, but I, don't, I can't find it. But you did answer the one question because you're asking for $2 million. But I see in the, in the stuff that you handed out here, if this is what the money's going for, it looks like staff and salaries, $595,000. Um, and then that breaks down. So I appreciate the breakdown. And then fringe benefits, which is health insurance, materials and supplies, transportation. Uh, I guess what I'm getting at is there's some pretty stringent uh, requirements for legacy funds. It's not supposed to, uh, it's supposed to supplement, not supplant. So we're not supposed to be um, funding things that are already funded somewhere else. It's just to help. And I'm wondering when you put this together, did you uh, make sure that the stuff that you're using it for will qualify for legacy funding? Um, Ms. Sally, and I think the council, you want to, I'm, I'm pretty sure council can, I. Well, I, you know, Mr. Chair, I don't necessarily need an answer now, but it's something that you're going to have to know uh, if, uh, as we move forward, that, uh, you know, the, this is something that probably isn't debated as much as it used to be, but it used to be a big deal. I mean, was, uh, as this bill was coming forward, uh, putting all the rules and regulations on this for a reason. Mm -hmm. So Mr. might uh, might want to check into that. Sure. Uh, Sarah Mahama. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Green, that's a good question. Um, to my understanding, it is, but we'll continue to work with council. The bill is not, it's still getting drafted. And so there, if there's like uh, a portion of it that it isn't um, uh, up with what legacy is specifically supposed to be, would be happy to take it up. And then, and then, Mr. Chair, the other thing too is, you know, it's it's the same theme that I that I've been on. I've watched, been on this legacy committee ever since I've been in office, even over in the House. And the the asks this year are are really up there. I mean, for for the limited amount of money. And so the question then too is, uh, can the project that you're asking for be scaled, uh, provided that uh, you know, there's not enough money to go around, and, and you don't get the full amount. Say you get five hundred thousand instead of the two million. Are the are the projects that you've got can they be scaled down uh, to accommodate for that? Mr. Chair, Senator Green, um, that's a really good question. Uh, how do I answer that? Um, well, I would say no, and that's because. It, one, we're asking for, I think, a million dollars 2024, a million dollars 2025. Um, it's a lot of money, and I'm sure there there have been, I've been sitting here, many organizations and groups who are coming to ask for a lot of money. Um, but this is the only Somali museum outside of Somalia. And so, like, a lot of folks from the diaspora come around the world to come and visit this, and I think... If they're asking for a million dollars, if a community is asking for that to be able to preserve their culture in a country that is clearly like struggling with the civil war, I think that's fair. And if we can do that as legislatures, I would say dig a little deeper and maybe give a little more. Thank you. Appreciate Senator Mahama for your answer. And so, um, the Somali Museum has been coming to us for, for legacy funding, and uh, it's under this jurisdiction. And so, uh, you know the the detail of it. You know we had to look at uh, again, but uh, but uh, overall it it fall under this our committee and our jurisdiction. 
And if you want to isolate itself into uh, just smiley community, uh, their taxpayer base do attribute much more than a million dollars, and that could go to arts and culture. And I appreciate Mr. Um, Osman Ali for preserve what's been many preserve what is, could have been destroyed in your homeland that, that leave it here and that, that brought, brought it here to Minneapolis to our uh, state uh, to our um, you know uh, land of 10,000 lake state so uh, we're, we're, we're good any Senator uh, Ms. Ali looks like, like you want to say something go ahead yeah, and uh, thanks for the committee. And this is the only museum that's functioning all around the world. And we are recognized as a Somali Museum of Minnesota all around the world. And it's in Minnesota. We are so lucky we have the only museum in Minnesota. And we want to move forward. And right now, we are working on our site that we're going to have a building in the future and a lot of Senate and the federal and even the bonding you know, bills that from you guys also helping us. So we wanna move forward. We have 1,500 artifact and historical pieces in Minnesota. That's not found anywhere else in the world as a Somali you know, artifact and cultural pieces. So thank you so much and that's how we are working and we are in every county in the state of Minnesota. If any county they say we didn't see Somali Museum, there we are not here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Any Chair. Last remark, uh, Sarah Muhammad. Yeah, just for closing comments, thank you for hearing this. I really appreciate you. And you're certainly right that this does fall under this jurisdiction. Um, you, for me as a young Somali um, person who hopes to one day have kids, I want my kids to learn about their culture and their, um, as we like to say, their daqan and who they are and be able to hold on to that part of who they are. And um, like right now, can't go back home because we're in a war and there isn't even a, a museum back home. The only one that we have is here and there's not even like a space for that. It's in the midst of a basement. And to ask, can you scale it down? No, we can't. We need more. And so I thank you for having this. And um, I will once again ask you to dig a little deeper and give us more. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll lay over Senator, oh, um, the, the uh, placeholder for Muhammad Bill for possible inclusion, the Somali Artifacts and Cultural Museum for possible inclusion. Okay, next on the agenda is Senator Coran. Senator File 143. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. We're happy to present Senate File 143. Um, it's uh, for a Veterans Regional Memorial Park in the city of Wyoming, uh, my largest city. And today I have um, the expert with me, would be the city administrator, Rob Linwood. Welcome. So, Mr. Lemon, do you want to just start off? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chair, her committee members today. Thank you, Senator Coran, for authoring our 143 uh, railroad park uh, uh, bill. Uh, the city of Wyoming's railroad park sits on the corner of East Viking Boulevard and Forest Boulevard in the city of Wyoming. This property has significant role in the history of Wyoming as it served as the site of the original Wyoming Railroad Depot. Today, this park hosts Wyoming's annual tree lighting ceremony and connects downtown Wyoming to the Sunrise Prairie Trail, which has 26 miles of pave, multi-use trails through Chisago County and Washington County. The proposed park would turn this plot of land into a regional trail destination in the heart of Wyoming. The Sunrise Prairie Trail serves walkers, hikers, bicyclists, inline skaters, as well as snowmobiles and horseback riding. This park has been envisioned and designed as a kind of gateway into the Wyoming community it sits in a corner of historic Wyoming and near many local Wyoming businesses. Uh, building on the existing trail amenities in the park, the proposed park master plan would create a trail destination in Wyoming, provide that respite on the trail, as well as an opportunity to visit the History Walk or Veterans Memorial. This project fulfills three main needs and will serve as an investment in the vitality of the Wyoming community. 
main focus of the park will be a veterans memorial that will honor and the service and sacrifice of members of the armed forces, past and present of Wyoming. And it, Wyoming has a history, a context, and story to be proud of. Whether residents and their families have been in Wyoming for generations or they just moved in, the stories of the past is something to be shared. The proposed history walk will share these stories. And finally, the transformation of this plot of land into a destination in downtown Wyoming is an investment in the community, its history, and honoring those who have served and sacrificed. And with that, I can stand for any questions. Any question from members? Okay. Well, looks like this is a good bill. Thank <laughs> Senator Curran, thank you, last you Mr. Chair. Closing we, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. We appreciate your support and, and uh, thank you for having, the, having us uh, before you today. Thank you, committee. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for thank bringing you so forth the Biome uh, Veteran Memorial mm -hmm. Plaza. Um, and we will lay over Senate File 143 for possible inclusion and legacy bill. And thank you, Mr. Linwood, Linwood, for being here as well. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll uh, go back on the bill that we kind of um, put on hold due to her kindness. Uh, Vice Chair, uh, <laughs> let everybody skip her two bills and now uh, we're ready to go back. It's actually number 10 and 11 on your agenda here. Uh, Senator McEwen will present Senate File 2582 and then followed by Senate File 1418. So anytime you're ready, Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Members, um, this is a presentation for Senate file number 2582, which I am very pleased to present. Um, this is a um, request for Minnesota Public Radio. Minnesota Public Radio was created in 1967 with one classical music station in Collegeville, Minnesota. It quickly expanded to regional news and classical music stations around the state. Today, NPR covers 95% of Minnesota's population with its coverage. While Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Public Radio, or NPR, has their headquarters here in St. Paul, they have six reporters spread throughout greater Minnesota, including Worthington, Rochester, St. Cloud, Moorhead, Bemidji, and my very own Duluth, providing local perspectives to the rest of the state. NPR has three separate broadcast services, NPR News, NPR Classical, and NPR The Current. Legacy funds go toward programming on all three services, highlighting Minnesota's arts and cultural heritage in all forms. Minnesota Public Radio has been receiving legacy funding since Minnesota voters approved the program. Since 2009, NPR has advanced the program's goal of spreading awareness of Minnesota's arts and cultural heritage by not only featured programs on NPR stations, but also bringing the arts out to underserved communities in the Twin Cities and to greater Minnesota. Currently, NPR receives $3.9 million in legacy funds. This bill is asking for $4.7 million to expand on current legacy programs and to create new ones. It is important to note the legacy funds provided to NPR do not go toward anything other than arts and cultural heritage. These funds do not go toward any political, sports, or current events programming. NPR has a strict accounting program to show where every dollar is spent and how legacy dollars and general operation dollars are not commingled. And with that, Mr. Chair, um, I am very pleased to introduce to the committee uh, Mr. Dushan Drew, um, who is um, joining us, uh, President of Minnesota Public Radio, to also um, offer testimony. Well, welcome, Mr. So Dushan, and please state your name for the record, and you may proceed. Sure thing. I'm Dushan Drew. I'm the president of Minnesota Public Radio. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senators. Thank you so much for your support, Senator Kuhn. Uh, as, as you've just heard, um, Minnesota Public Radio covers all of Minnesota. We've got um, signals up all across state between the, the transmitters and the relays that we've got set up, 80 towers across the state. There's no better way to reach Minnesota than through Minnesota Public Radio. We, through our three services, NPR News, your classical and the current provide a wide range of services and a wide range of uh, points of connection for Minnesota. 
we uh, just last year updated our mission statement. We're a 56-year-old organization, um, and our new mission statement reads that we are here uh, to create the future of public media by amplifying voices to inform, include, and inspire. And we do that across all of our services. We do much of that, frankly, with the support we get um, from you all with legacy dollars to really help Minnesota better see and value itself in ways that really uh, few institutions can provide. Uh, we're excited about the role we play in helping Minnesota connect more deeply to itself and understand itself. And uh, we know that the support that you provide allows us to do that and to extend uh, into the ambitions we have, extend the ways in which we do it. Um, our staff, as mentioned, uh, is concentrated here in the Twin Cities, just a few blocks away, but we have reporters in communities all across the state um, reporting on those communities, raising their families in the communities, and I think that brings a degree of connection and authenticity that's really essential to our ability to help um, capture and reflect who we are. Um, we do that once again uh, through music, through uh, broadcast, through uh, news coverage, through live events. Uh, it's multi-dimensional, the, the, the offerings we've got. And you think about um, sort of a, a map of Minnesota, you won't find many pockets where we're not there on a daily, it's offered 24 hour basis, frankly, shaping uh, who we are and telling our story. Our, our uh, request is really designed to allow us to continue across all three services to help Minnesota be its best self. Uh, music and the arts are just a big part of how um, we experience life together and build connections. Our classical music station, through its Class Notes program, um, got out to almost 100 communities in the 21-22 school year. We're hoping to do even better than that in the future because we know what a difference it makes for young children to have live musicians come and perform for them. Uh, our, and I'm not going to go through all the things that we do, but just as examples, you know, uh, through uh, the current, our AAA uh, station, music station, that uh, really is uh, the best place to find out about local music, Minnesota music. Um, we have all kinds of artists getting their break, frankly, by being played on our airwaves or attending events that um, we set up. We did an event at MIA on Sunday called Rock the Cradle. Well, the current was the primary sponsor. We had more than 9,000 people come through the door, 5,000 in the first two hours, to hear just a wide range of artists perform across the day. Uh, our news station, uh, which, um, as I mentioned, has reporters all across the state, does a wide range of things, uh, particularly as it relates to arts coverage. You probably have heard on the Art Towns coverage, where we engage community members to um, tell stories about arts and entertainment options happening in their local communities that covers by design uh, work happening all across the state of Minnesota. We're interested in doing even more of that to get into more communities and be an even better reflection of the beautiful things happening on a daily basis here in Minnesota. And we've launched um, through the current, it's worth saying, a new uh, stream, not broadcast, uh, but a new stream um, called Carbon Sound, which is uh, hip hop, R&B, and other sort of forms of traditionally black music, which obviously crosses into many, many communities. But um, it, we're one of nine stations, uh, public media stations in the country, to offer this format. And we did it in partnership with KMOJ Radio in North Minneapolis. We recognized that we could do something with them that neither of us could really do as well on our own. And we're really proud of the fact that we're um, doing what we should be doing, which is identifying and serving new audiences, and once again, finding ways to stitch this place together in, in healthier ways. Um, other things that we're looking at trying to expand through uh, the funding is a monuments project where we really think, um, I was a history major in college, a deep appreciation for how we got to now. Um, we really think that um, there's an opportunity in doing a highly interactive project where we would have uh, folks all across the state of Minnesota identify and help us document plaques and other sort of markers that indicate um, who we celebrate, who we, who we remember, and, and why. And I think in this digital age, it's got a real potential to be something that is highly engaging and gets people um, talking about the communities they live in and learning more about parts of the state they might never visit, but that give them a little more reason to lean in and, and better understand this place. Both folks who um, were here hundreds of years ago and folks who are relatively new but still shaping what life 
what life here is in Minnesota. Um, I could go on, but I think what I really want you to know is that through our programming, both on the air and on demand and in real life out in community, we really are committed to serving all of who we are and being a force for good. It's a pretty fractious time. We really see our role as um, helping Minnesota, as I said, better see and, and value itself. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Touche. Any question from members? Uh, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see that, you know, I, I see you've got an increase on yours too. It's probably not as much of a percentage of increase, but it's still substantial increase in the, in the ask from last year. Um, and I did notice you also had quite a pretty large uh, ask in, in the bonding bill. Uh, can you tell me uh, how many different sources of state funding you guys get? Yes, so yeah, uh, uh, certainly, uh, Chair and Senator Green. Uh, we, the, the legacy dollars are specifically for our programming and the increase we've asked for, well, I touched on some of them, we've, it's in the materials you have. I was trying in the interest of time not to go through all of them, but across all three of our services, there are things we want to add. We, um, through much of the funding, frankly, it's, it's passed through to artists, so lots of Minnesota musicians, um, whether it's you know, for the orchestra and, and folks in, in that genre or rock musicians for the current, they get paid for the dollars that we get from Legacy, so it isn't, it isn't just sitting with an NPR, it allows us to do programming all across the state and allow artists to make a living. Um, on the new side, I mentioned the, um, the monuments project. We also have a, a relatively new, we just rolled it out uh, last year, it was very well received, a, a new stream of stories called North Star Journey, which has been highly recommended you take a look at it if you haven't come across it on the air, um, which is just a great job documenting more dimensions of who we are as Minnesotans. We want to do some more of that. That was initially rolled out as a five-month trial. Let's see how this goes and people loved it, could not believe the amount of feedback we got, and we thought this is something we should continue to do. So um, the, the, the legacy dollars uh, are really focused on trying to do even more to help Minnesota appreciate, uh, understand what's going on here in terms of music and in terms of our history and our, and our culture. The other uh, funding we're seeking is for things like tower maintenance, frankly. You know, we've got, um, a lot of equipment all across the state. We're very committed. I take great pride in the fact that no one else reaches across the state the way we do. Um, there's no increase requested there. We're, we're just looking to try and maintain the equipment and services that we do so that when, uh, and we're the backbone, it's worth saying, of the emergency alert system. So it, it's not a small thing. When, when things go sideways, people find out about it through us. It's basically being able to maintain that system. And I, Thank you. Um, I, I'm not actually aware of, of a bonding request that NPR has made this year, so perhaps Senator Green, you could let me know which um, Senate file that is. Maybe maybe it's another radio um, group, or I, I don't know. But I, I just received information that there's there's no bonding request from NPR this year. Yeah. Sure. Well, then I apologize for that. It must have been for uh, public television, but there That's was a okay. bonding request for some. Okay. Yeah, we have two funds, uh, okay. streams okay. of funding from the state, and one, as I said, supports equipment outstate in greater Minnesota, and the other is a program we've discussed. Okay. But then uh, on, the, on that same line of questioning then, uh, how much of your funding comes from the state, I guess? About 5%. So okay. it's, it's meaningful, right? They're the things I just spelled out. We really want to do. We want to do them well. We want to be able to reach more Minnesotans, but it's not what drives the train in that sense. I mean, a lot of the funding we get, you've heard this if you listen, tune in, right? It comes from members, it comes from underwriters who are a form of advertisers, it comes through distributing content all across the country. Yep. Mr. Chair, thank you. And, uh, and so I'm glad, that, I'm glad to hear that. I, I do know that uh, I've gone around and around with uh, public radio and public TV as far as uh, um, the, the funding sources and the fact that they, uh, they rely on contributions but they don't advertise, but actually they really do because you, you talk about your sponsors. And, and one of the things that uh, I've been trying to point out to folks for a very long time is that there's a lot of people who still believe that because you're called public radio or public TV or something else, that somehow you belong to the state, but you are private uh, organizations 
that are getting funding from the state and private companies. And so just one last question then, will any of the, the legacy dollars uh, that are going into uh, uh, public radio, will they be used for salaries in any way? They'll be used for salaries for staff members doing the work and salaries for the artists we hire. It doesn't, I'm, I'm here today obviously and I spent quite a bit of time on this. It doesn't go a dime of it toward my salary and all the details of how it will be used is spelled out in our proposal. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Jashay, for clarifying that. Um, that makes good sense. Uh, Sam McCune, closing remark. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members, uh, for considering this request. Um, the work that NPR does with the legacy funds are exactly tailored toward the purpose of what legacy is all about and have always been. So um, respectfully, members, I ask for your support uh, for this ask, for this good work. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you, Sarah McEwen and Mr. Touche. Uh, we'll lay over Senate File 2582 for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. Thank you. And Senator McEwen, your bill, uh, 1418, uh, Children Museum. And next on the follow, follow this bill will be Senator Pappas' bill. Um. Thank you, um, Chair Her uh, and members will be quick with this one as well. Um, uh, thank you for hearing Senate File 1418. Members, the bill before you today will provide legacy funding for 10 of Minnesota's children's museums. The Coalition of Greater Minnesota Children's Museums is made up of both long-standing and emerging muse museums in Duluth, Grand Rapids, Mankato, St. Cloud, Baxter Brainerd, Breckenridge, Bloomington, Wilmer, Hutchinson, and Fergus Falls. Together, these museums serve hundreds of thousands of children from all 87 of Minnesota's counties. Each museum provides space for children to discover and explore their interests through authentic objects, hands-on exhibits, and multisensory activities. Museums prioritize local history, industry, and recreation into their exhibits and programming, enhancing children's understanding of their own communities. Children's museums have always been important for children and their families. I can say that personally from my own experience as well. Uh, but during the pandemic, the demands for children's museums only grew as they provide children centered play that is safe and secure. This legacy request will support access, programming, and exhibits at our state's children's museums to ensure that there are minimal barriers for Minnesota's children in accessing their local museum and can experience effective play-based learning. I will now turn our presentation over, Mr. Chair, to my testifier, Cameron Kruger, President and CEO of Duluth's very own Children's Museum, to speak on behalf of this coalition's request. Welcome, uh, Director Kruger. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may uh, go on. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Vice Chair McEwen, uh, for supporting our request. My name is Cameron Kruger, and I am the President and CEO of the Duluth Children's Museum, obviously in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, I'm here today representing this coalition uh, that Senator McEwen had noted. We are located all throughout greater Minnesota, and together our coalition serves over half a million families and children annually, uh, capturing visitors from every single Minnesota county. And we have a specific concentration of museums serving rural communities, um, folks who really need these services and need access to arts and culture. Programs supported by legacy funds are incredibly impactful on the well-being of children and families. Play is children's work and is critical to their development. Playful interactive learning is the most effective type of learning and our children's museums provide these experiences to tens of thousands of children every single day. Access programs are central to all of our museum's work. Over a quarter of the Duluth Children's Museum's member families receive a Discover for All membership, uh, which is a scholarship at our highest level at no cost for those families that are experiencing hardships. And many children's museums offer the same kind of access programming. We are strategically located in Duluth's Lincoln Park, uh, the city's most socioeconomically and racially diverse neighborhood, to support the families where they live. And many of our access families tell us that the museum is the only safe place for them and their children to play. 
Our museums are community hubs for both informal and standards-based arts and culture learning that engages kids and caring adults through exhibits and programs, field trips, and special events. Each of our museums offer experiences that are unique to our community. That's highlighting local history, regional industry, and the culture that's unique to each area in the state where these children's museums exist. Daily, in children's museums across uh, the state, county and school caseworkers meet at the museum for supervised visits and assessments with children and families. It's a safe environment, welcoming and respectful, encouraging families to interact and explore. The kind of interaction is important to all families, but particularly of value to those that are rebuilding their relationships. Duluth Children's Museum has been a grateful recipient of legacy funding for many years. At the beginning, there were three such museums, and today there are 13 children's museums in our state, which is a boon for children, uh, but we realize um, is a lot for you as legacy committee to consider. Legacy funds have been absolutely vital to our ability to create impactful STEM, arts, and cultural exhibits, educational programs, as well as to remove barriers to access for the children and families that need us most. As a major part of this request, we are asking for a direct appropriation. This will empower our museums to be even more planful, to maximize the use of our legacy funds and provide greater certainty. When we are no longer competing for each other for grants, we are able to collaborate more fully and maximize the dollars that we're receiving from legacy. Four years ago, in the first biennium uh, of this most recent change to competitive grants, the Duluth Children's Museum's legacy grant uh, was slashed to a very small fraction of what we had received previously uh, through appropriations prior. Similarly, the Children's Discovery Museum in Grand Rapids had to eliminate their entire popular school group program uh, because they could no longer subsidize the cost after suddenly being zeroed out on legacy funds in the competitive process. It wasn't that they didn't have a great application, um, we just didn't know what those expectations were for our museums. That means that thousands of children were unable to take in an amazing learning through play experience that complements and supports their in-school learning. So thank you for considering strengthening children's museums and supporting children throughout Minnesota with an annual appropriation of legacy funds. Thank you, Director Kruger. Any question from members? Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've been to the Duluth Children's Museum with my kids, and it's a fun place. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Close. Chair, yes, to the Grand Rapids Children's Museum, you're in incorrect, sir. They used to receive a direct appropriation, and they were told they didn't get their appropriation that year because their displays didn't meet what the Humanity Center felt was culturally appropriate. So I hope, hopefully this will correct some of that, and going forward, you know, They'll work with the museums, and if they want something different, we'll explain that to them instead of just cutting them off. Okay. Good. Point well taken. We're all here to improve ourselves. <laughs> so, uh, Senator McCune, any uh, closing comments? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, as Mr. Kruger has illustrated in his testimony, this investment is critical for our children's museums, not just in Duluth, but across the state. This investment ensures that all children and families will have access to play-based learning that ignites their creativity and imagination outside of the home in the classroom. Thank you very much for considering Senate File 1418. Okay, with that, we lay over Senate File 1418 for possible inclusion and the legacy on of this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We're going to make a little hop here. Uh, thank you, members, for your patience. Thank you, testifier. I um, want to, uh, let's see, uh, pass the word to my testifier. You know, uh, I, I carry your bill, and being the chair, you may have to be the most patient testifier all the time. I hope will be the last person to testify my bill. I'm going to jump to Senator Pappas, who I put it last here, but being that she was the, she is the bonding chair, and she had a lot of work to do, and I thought, she, <laughs> I thought, <laughs> I, <laughs> I thought that she, you know, it'd be appropriate to put her last, but it looks like she, she um, made it a little on time, a little early than I expected. So um, I'd like to give her the time here to present her bill, Senate File 1007, uh, Minnesota Children's Museum. 
Uh, thank you so much, um, Chair Her, and it's kind of uh, appropriate to hear this after Senator McEwen's bill because we both love our children's museums. I'm very excited to carry this bill, which will provide critical funding for the Minnesota Children's Museum. For more than 40 years, the museum has been delivering on its mission of sparking children's learning through play. Minnesota Children's Museum has made great use of legacy funds in the past, and thank you very much for those, and it will continue to do so. Hundreds of thousands of families have enjoyed new learning experiences made possible by legacy dollars. Looking ahead, the museum seeks additional funding to continue evolving the hands-on exhibits that delight families and engage young minds. The museum also is eager to add resources to allow the organization to re-energize its community engagement efforts, reaching underserved communities through programs and special events. When kids play, they grow and learn. It's that simple. Let's make sure Minnesota Children's Museum continues to serve all of Minnesota in the best way possible. All right, yeah, that's why I miss, uh, We have Mr. Ingrazia. Ingrazia, I, yep. Mr. Ingrazia, state your name for the record and you may proceed. Thank you, I'm Bob Ingrazia. I'm Vice President of External Relations at uh, Minnesota Children's Museum. I uh, thank uh, uh, you, Mr. Chair, and the committee matter members, and Senator Pappas for your support. Um, pleased to uh, speak on behalf of the Children's Museum today. Um, and as the Senator mentioned, uh, for more than 40 years, the museum has been uh, providing playful learning experiences for Minnesota families. Um, these are hands-on, open-ended activities uh, that, where kids take the lead, and echoing uh, some of the remarks from the, the Ch uh, Children's Museum Coalition about the importance of play. We're talking about activities here where, where kids get to explore, create, think, make mistakes, try again, and just keep at it, developing the skills they th that uh, they need to thrive at school, at home, really everywhere else. This is uh, lifelong learning and kids learning and growing through play. And that's what uh, Minnesota Children's Museum um, specializes in. Uh, the Children's Museum is grateful uh, for previous le uh, legacy funding that we've received. Um, and, the, and the Children's Museum has put these funds in the past to great use um, for Minnesota families. Uh, we've had uh, play spots um, in libraries throughout uh, Minnesota. Um, we had a litera uh, literacy exhibit that toured throughout the state. Um, and we have developed uh, new experiences at, the, at our St. Paul Museum. Uh, most recently, um, we developed a, a really fun new exhibit based on a real-life shipwreck in Lake, uh, Lake, uh, sorry, Lake Superior, um, and that recently opened thanks to Legacy. We would not have been able to open that exhibit without this critical funding um, from uh, Legacy. So now we're asking to do even more. Uh, two uh, main initiatives. Uh, new interactive learning experiences at the St. Paul Museum. Um, our families and, and kids that visit the museum uh, expect new experiences. It's part of the, the um, it's, it's critical to, to keep evolving the experiences at the museum. Uh, kids are thrilled, families are thrilled when they encounter new things and when kids get to explore, their minds really light up on fire. Uh, so some of the new experiences we're planning um, in our STEM gallery called Forces at Play, we're uh, developing a new uh, water valve challenge. This will be a series of uh, tubes uh, and valves where uh, kids will be challenged to um, explore the power of water and, and move objects within the tubes and they'll have to use critical thinking. Um, and, and other skills to try to manage how uh, the water flows. Um, and, and again, that develops critical thinking and other uh, uh, important skills. Um, and another new experience we're planning is a pretend vet clinic. Um, this would be in our, our popular Our World Gallery. This is a pretend town, one of our most popular galleries. And in the pretend vet clinic, kids will be able to try on new roles uh, in caring for animals. Um, and really, the the upstream learning that's happening here is developing empathy um, and social emotional skills. And so these um, new experiences that we would develop will not happen without um, this important legacy funding. Second big initiative, community engagement. Um, you know, like a lot of organizations, the Children's Museum had to downsize um, during the pandemic. And what we're trying to do, and one of the 
things that we needed to scale back on was uh, community outreach and programming and things that we were doing beyond our walls. And so what we're asking for now are funds to help regrow and re-envision how we do community outreach uh, to communities that, uh, that are outside our walls. Um, so we're, we're talking about um, ways to help serve uh, communities in need. Uh, for example, special events at the museum that bring in uh, uh, underserved communities for special after hours events at the museum. Resources for parents to help them support their children's playful learning uh, in the home. And a community liaison network to help um, uh, get input and help shape the experiences and programs that the museum provides from a diverse community. So again, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, represent the museum at the committee. And uh, um, we urge the uh, committee to, uh, to support these important funds and the important work that the museum is doing to spark children's learning through play. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. 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 Chairman, just Thank an additional Atlas. comment. Um, currently, the, um, the museum is serving about 350,000 people a year. And before the pandemic, they were serving 450,000 a year. So they're working to build back to that level. So they, they have incredible attendance. OK, thank you, Senator Pappas. Question from members? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, same question. Uh, is, there, is this a, uh, an increase from your last biennium ask? Uh, Mr. Ingrises? Ingrises. Yes. Ingrises. Um, yes. Um, it is a, 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 a funding increase per uh, each year of the biennium. Yes, it is. Senator Green. Uh, thank you for that. How much? Uh, current uh, allocation is uh, 750,000 for the biennium, and we're seeking uh, so, yeah, right for the biennium, and we're seeking 1.3 for the biennium. Senator Green. Okay, so it's almost double, and I'm not going to beat up on the Children's Museum because I've thought for a very long time that if the, this is probably one of the best places for legacy funds, but. Uh, because I think the children's museums are doing good, but the smaller children's mu museums across the state are getting $150,000 a piece. And so that, that seems a little out of whack, but uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that the, the extra money is gonna be put to good use there. Um, I know that every, every biennium you also come up with new, uh, uh, new exhibits, but it uh, does seem like a pretty substantial increase. Sarah Mr. Chairman and Senator Green, that's why I brought up the number of children they serve. So they're serving really the entire metropolitan area um, with one museum. So it's, it's very well attended and school groups come in, preschool groups come in. Um, they have a very broad outreach. Plus I think you also have done stuff statewide as well. The same gracias. Right, the museum draws from the entire state in terms of attendance. Uh, and I talked about some of the other statewide initiatives in the, in the past that have served the entire state. And I do want to clarify, I think I misspoke uh, slightly, and just to clarify on the museum's history of legacy funding for a, n a number of uh, bienniums going back uh, to, I, I think, even the, well, early on in, in the legacy program, the museum was getting a million dollars per biennium. Then there were some changes related to um, the museum uh, being, t uh, uh, part of or be, being with the Rochester Museum and Minnesota Children's Museum essentially incubated the Rochester Museum which is now separate so there were some changes over the course of two bienniums that that brought the museum's um, legacy allocation down um, to its current level but historically the Children's Museum for I think four bienniums in a row got one million dollars per biennium we're currently seeking 1.3 so just to clarify that looking at the historical allocation to the Children's Museum through Legacy, it's been one million for a number of bienniums. Then there was some change related to the switch over with Rochester becoming a separate entity. So really, we're looking at it as an increase from one million to 1.3. OK, Senator Green. All right. Well, um, um, closing remarks, Senator Pappas? I made my closing remarks. Thank you. <laughs> OK. All right, we'll now lay, lay uh, Senate file 1007 for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Legacy Bill. Uh, next is uh, Senate file 533, Senator Pappas. Thanks so much. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As my testifiers come forward, I'll start with these talking points. Um, the Hmong Cultural Center started in 1992 and is one of the oldest Hmong organizations in Minnesota. It's located just four blocks from the Minnesota State Capitol. Uh, they have a storefront museum, and it's the first standalone Hmong museum in Minnesota. Visitors learn substantively about Hmong culture, history, contributions to Minnesota, and Hmong folk, folk art traditions through cultural objects, artworks, display panels, and interactive video exhibits. I had a one-on-one -on -one tour myself there recently, and they pram a lot of material into a very small space. The museum is open to the public daily on University Avenue in St. Paul and serves the 90,000 Hmong in Minnesota, as well as members of the broader community seeking to learn more about their Hmong neighbors. In 2022, more than 50 schools and community groups booked guided tour field trips to the museum for a total of 1,300 visitors. They're on track to provide tours to many more schools and community organizations and walk-in visitors in 2023. The funding being requested will support the following activities over the next two years. Support for a new expanded storefront museum location of 1,200 square feet at University and Western, and believe me, they need it. They have a lot crammed in there, and it's hard to get the tour groups in. They can't be very large. Also, support for staffing to assist with museum marketing and to lead tours to school groups and the general public. Support for the development of new school curriculums related to Hmong folk art traditions, the wedding and funeral songs and sung poetry, and Hmong culture, language, clans, religion, weddings, and funerals. Also support for a new guided tour app to allow them to provide virtual field trips and to support the self-guided tour experience for walk-in visitors. To sum up, if this project is funded, Minnesota residents will have greater opportunities to learn about Hmong history in Minnesota, Hmong achievements in the state, and Hmong culture and Hmong folk art forms. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to introduce my witness, my testifier, who's the executive director of the Hmong Culture Museum, Mr. Tsupa Lee. Welcome, Mr. Lee. Uh, uh, please state your name for the record, and you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the rest of the committee. My name is Song Pao Li. I'm the Executive Director of the Hmong Cultural Center. Today I want to testify about the Hmong Cultural Museum. In the state of Minnesota, we have about 90,000 Hmong live in the state of Minnesota. One third of the API community in the state of Minnesota. Throughout the whole United States, the Hmong population is 300,000 Hmong live in the US. So the Hmong Cultural Museum is a very important resource for our kids, for our younger generation to come to learn who we are. The reason is because we don't have a state that after we lost our culture, we can go back to the country to learn and bring back to the US. And that is one of the issues that, that's why we have the Hmong Cultural Museum to provide education to the Hmong or younger generation or to the non-Hmong community who live in the state of Minnesota and throughout the whole United States. And we have people come across from the South, East, and West come and learn about the Hmong Cultural Museum in St. Paul here. So I believe that the Hmong Cultural Museum is one of the most resourceful to the state of Minnesota and in St. Paul here. We have a culture, the museum, Traveler exhibit, as now, is still in Houston, Minnesota. In Houston County, Minnesota, we don't have a Hmong population in there, but we have a great hunting season during the times, many Hmong men who's hunting out there. I believe the community who live in there, they don't know who are these people. They might just say, oh, they were hunter. They were Asian community but they don't know who we are and where we came from. So that is a great thing that the travel, Elizabeth has been traveled to Houston, Minnesota to teach the community in there to learn who we are. And I have the Hmong community member who come to the Hmong Cultural Museum. Talk to me about, is it you are part of the Minnesota Historical Society? I say, no, we are not. Why are you showing over there? I said, no. The reason is, in 2015, 
Minister of Historical Society has shown we are the mom in, the, the, in their facility for over a period. But they removed that. However, the Hmong Cultural Center we still maintain our show and the museum for the community to come and learn who we are. And not just the Hmong community only. We have children from K to 12 come as a large group, come and learn and see what we have in the museums. And we have professional, professional staff like teacher, nurses, come into the cultural museum and learn what we have there. So today, I'm here to testify that the Hmong culture is a very resourceful. In 2022, I has been traveled to other smaller community museum. They have the same resource what we have. And I don't know how many people come to visit there, but in our museum, we have a lot of young group, high school age and middle school age, the professional sector come in to see what we have at the, at the cultural center museum. So this is very important resource to the community. And thanks for Senator Pappas has been stopped by see what we have there. And I believe, uh, Mr. Her, uh, your colleague has been coming and see, and my house been there. And that is what we see that the Hmong Museum has been very important to the Hmong community and to the other non-Hmong who come to learn our history, where we came from, and why we come to the United States. So that is what I felt today. I want to express my sincerely to tell you and the rest of the committee that Monk Cultural Center Museum is a very important educational place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Any questions from members? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Lee, for being here. You know, uh, it's one of the few organizations, like Senator Pappas, say uh, that uh, uh, began again at the early start of the Hmong community being here, and we st you're still here, and provide you know our archive for our future generation to come as our culture are quickly uh, dissolving in in this modern days and. Thank you for the work that you do. And Senator Pappas, thank you for... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. Okay. We'll lay over Senate File 533 for possible inclusion and the legacy omnibus bill. So I'm um, going to go back to our order right now. It's number 23. Senator Lane. Senator Icorn. Where's Senator Icorn? I'm presenting Oh, you are presenting. Okay. All right, well, sen yes, Senator Icon will uh, present for Senator Lane, uh, Senate File 575, uh, Litchfield Op Opera House. We have about eight bill left, um, bill and I know though, again to to those who come and testify for my bill, hang on, we save the best for last. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Senator Icorn, um, go ahead to the bill, Senate File Five Seven Five. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 575. This is not my bill. This is Senator Lang's bill. I'm not a co-sponsor, but as a fellow committee member, being he's unable to be here today, I agreed to present this for him. It's a $100,000 appropriation in 2024 from the uh, Arts and Culture Fund to the Commissioner of Administration for a grant to Greater Litchfield Opera House. Um, and we ha do have a testifier here today. I see there's two on the list. There may be one on online. I'm not certain. Uh, um, but she can probably touch on this much better than I can and can tell you all about the project. And there is some additional information in your packets, Mr. Chair. Okay. There are inf additional information. And, uh, yep, uh, Mr. Ms., uh, it's Lise. Ms. Lise, uh, please take your name for the record and go ahead with the, your testimony. Connie Lise. That's spelled L-I-E-S. And my co-presenter was to be Karen Erdahl, but she's unable to attend. 
The Litchfield Opera House was built in 1900 as the grandest opera house west of the Mississippi at the time it was built. It was the hub of all of the cultural activities for what at that time was the edge of the prairie. All the great acts came. High opera was finally introduced to the community, theater productions, and it moved on from there to be the home of the beginning of the um, Land O'Lakes Corporation, or at the, at, for us it was First District Association, and for, it was the first place for the REA. After the bill was signed, it was um, immediately uh, formed there. And it goes on and on to political meetings. Uh, one of the ones was the first reading of the Volstead Act uh, before it actually went to Congress. Um, Mr. Volstead came out to see how Litchfield had went dry <laughs> before the rest of the country. Anyway, it continued on. And then, unfortunately, um, theater began to die. And the building had uh, suffered water damage. And they were looking at tearing it down. But something came along called the Great Depression. And when the Depression hit, they didn't have the money to do it. So instead, they got WOPA grants and changed the building so that they could hold the grain and chicken shows. And after that, it was, became the real hub of the community. Everything happened there. Um, until the 70s and then to till 2000, when it was completely consumed as a um, City Hall, and then it was slated for demolition. And after seven years, the Greater Litchfield Opera House Association purchased the building and began renovating it. So we have worked with the SHPO office and previous grants to develop a plan. We are currently finishing last year's up. Unfortunately, uh, the bids, the estimates before COVID were $100,000 to finish the inside. And after COVID, they were 400,000. So we took $100,000 of uh, legacy money and turned it into $200,000 worth of project by a lot of sweat equity and a lot of very smart purchasing. Everything we bought or buy is sourced within Minnesota, unless it's absolutely not available here. Um, and we so far have found everything for the building available here, and all of our labor comes from Minnesota. This project will allow us to uh, continue on with the scope of work which you were provided, I'm hoping, and that will be uh, items uh, six, seven, and eight on the scope of work, which is our upper level balcony mezzanine, and that will add, to, um, add another 100 seats to our ability. Right now, we are selling out on our children's theater events, and we are um, also selling out for uh, rentals for the large, we're the largest rental availability in the area. And uh, we have MnDOT meetings, we have city meetings, you name it, we do it. And so what we're doing is we are developing a whole new history um, of memories for our city. So we can look at what the building was in the past and know all of those things, and then look forward to what it's going to be for the new memories. So we would really encourage you to look favorably upon our continuing with this uh, project. Thank you, Ms. Lees, for uh, your, your testimony. Um, members, any questions? Senator uh, Kunish? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Lees. Um, what is the REA? Oh, the Rural Electric Association. Okay, that's what um, I thought. It was the Rural Electrification Act was what was actually signed. Okay. And the very first one that was then um, done, I can tell you a quick story if you're willing to hear a little joke, but it's true. Uh, the, the ladies were there. Uh, the um, a uh, gentleman was there from Washington when the telegram came through and he told them they were at a meeting and the ladies dipped into their bank, which, you know, in that time, days it was their bra, and came out with their $5 because they did not want their children to have their eyes ruined studying by lamplight and they wanted to have electric hot water in the barns for mm. milking. 
uh, follow up? Yes, I want to point out. Um, you mentioned that you've been working with SHPO, um, yes, which is the state historical preservation office, right? Yes, So has that building, or have you applied for that to become a, um, like a, a historic site? Yes, it's been on the National Register since 1986. Okay. And GLOA is a 501c3. We don't do anything at all to the building or the grounds that is not approved by the State Historic Preservation Office. So um, they worked with us through a grant to develop a plan, which is the scope of work before you. So they have already approved all of the work we want to do. One more question. Sarah, Sarah Konish. Is there actually opera sung there? Uh, yes. <laughs> the uh, last one we had uh, was a young lady who is a, a going to college to become an opera singer. But previous to that, the Minnesota State Band uh, came out. They played at our place, and we're hoping they'll come back. But they brought a professional opera singer. And we have some of the best acoustics in the state of Minnesota. Mm. Uh, they were really, really surprised, their opera singer, because most places that they go, they don't hear those tones. And uh, so that's one of the, the things that we have tried very hard to preserve is the fabulous acoustics. Right now we have uh, recording ability. Uh, we have a stage with stage lights and a full sound system has been added. And we do artist recording for emerging artists. Um, especially for young people that, you know, wouldn't have any other opportunity to record their music. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's a good story. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you. And I know it's late and you all want to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ms. Lee. So uh, your testimonies. Uh, Sarah Icon, any closing remarks for this bill? Nope. Thank you for the opportunity to, to have me present this for Senator Lang, Mr. Chair. If we could lay it over for possible inclusion. Yes. We, lay, we will lay Senate file 575 for possible inclusion of the legacy omnibus bill. And next is uh, Senate file 1170. Uh, it's also Senator Lane bill, and you'll be representing. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to present Senate file 1170. And much like the last bill, I'll be presenting this bill for Senator Lang. This would be a $50,000 appropriation in the year 2024 for the Minnesota State Band to provide public performances across the state of Minnesota. And Senator Lang did provide me uh, a few bullet points here to share with you guys before we hand it over to the testifiers. The Minnesota State Band is a nonprofit organization with the purpose of contributing to the musical development and appreciation of music throughout the state of Minnesota. The State Band was founded in 1898 and the band is celebrating its 125th anniversary. Unique fact, the band is the only remaining state band in the United States. It's taken part in many uh, major state of Minnesota events over the years, including the transfer of the Minnesota battle flags from the old to the new state capitol in 1905, the restoration of the flags in 1985, and the rededication of the capitol in 2017. In recent years, the band has played extensive summer concerts throughout the state. Uh, the band performs year-round and has staged concerts in the metro area and in greater Minnesota, which has been supported by legacy grants in, in years past. Um, they've built partnerships with school and community groups. Uh, the band's concerts are free and open to all. They have approximately 50 members. And if you want a, a little preview of the state band, Mr. Chair, they practice in the Department of Administration building cafeteria area on Wednesday evenings. So Maybe some evening during session, a few of us should go over for a free preview. And I'll, with that, I'll pass it over to the testifiers, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Icon. I would love that. Yeah. And yes, um, go ahead, the, the testifier. Please state your name for the record, and you may. Uh, uh, my present. name is Craig Allen, and I am a member of the board of directors of the Minnesota State Band, and I also play drums for the uh, organization. Uh, the Minnesota State Band is a 45-piece concert band that performs a wide variety of music throughout the year. Uh, the, although the uh, uh, conductor receives an honorarium, no one else in the organization is paid. In fact, all members have to pay a fee of $80 a year in order to be a part of the band. This year, the band celebrates 125 years as an arts organization. 
we are definitely part of Minnesota's rich history. If we receive the legacy funding, our goals are to increase the number of concert tours, continuing to reach out to smaller communities in outstate Minnesota, sharing our love for music with residents, and playing joint concerts with community bands and school bands throughout the state. Many arts organizations never perform but in large concert halls in the Twin Cities. In contrast, the Minnesota State Band brings its music to the people, performing in the communities where they live. Most arts organizations charge admission fees to attend. The Minnesota State Band never charges an admission to any of its concerts. We have provided the committee with a handout which describes in detail three concert tours we took using the first uh, grant of uh, legacy funds. And look what we achieved. We traveled to Alexandria and performed a joint concert with the Alexandria High School Band. On another trip, we joined the Moose Lake Community Band in a concert on the Iron Range. In fact, that was a three-day tour. We entertained over 500 young people at the Cherry School in Iron, Minnesota. And we performed at the 1910 Opera House in Litchfield. The only thing that prevents us from traveling more to more small towns and playing in more community and school bands is money. After all, it takes quite a bit to transport a 45-member concert band from town to town. But that is exactly what we would like to do. People who live in small towns deserve a variety of quality music, just as much as people in large cities. During the pandemic, we, when we were unable to perform, the Minnesota Band worked hard to improve our organization. In 2019, we hired the accounting firm to audit our accounts. The accounting firm found that our finances were in order and no improprieties. In fact, we have an annual review now of financial records. The Minnesota State Band hired an attorney to help us draft new bylaws and stronger protections to address claims of harassment and conflicts of interest. Finally, the band hired a mediator to help resolve some issues that had threatened to uh, split the small nonprofit. We are committed to operating our organization in the most ethical and financially responsible manner that we can to preserve the future of the Minnesota State Band. So please support the Minnesota State Band, the only remaining state band in the nation. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, Mr. Luzzi? Yes. Go ahead with the uh, testimony. Mr. Chair and Senate Committee members, my name is Keith Liuzzi. I am the principal conductor of the Minnesota State Band. I've been in this position since 2016. Uh, it's an honor to, to be with such a dedicated group of musicians. I just want to highlight a couple things that Craig said. Um, the number one thing I want to reemphasize is that we, the Minnesota State Band, is here to serve the people of Minnesota with live, in-person, free public performances at a high artistic level. We're not just another community band. We're the Minnesota State Band, again with that rich legacy. And we are committed to sharing our gifts of music making with the people of Minnesota, whether it's in the metro area or outlying areas. As conductor, I strive to program and commission works for concert band by Minnesota composers. With our last legacy grant, we commissioned David Evan Thomas to write a wonderful piece called One Fair Summer Evening, which highlights an ex his, four, four movements that highlight experiences um, in the Minnesota State Fair. If it, I think that might still be available on our website. I'd encourage you to take a look. But we are, I uh, would like you to, before I end my testimony, I just want to invite you to our next concert, which is coming up on April 22nd at the History Center. It is a, 
uh, both a celebration of our 125th anniversary and a celebration of Earth Day, which was the last concert we intended to perform back in 2020 before the pandemic. So we're anxious to play some of that wonderful music. Thank you and look forward to that. Uh, I think as far as I know, one of our uh, legacy members, a drummer, Sarah Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we need more drummers. <laughs> Just, we do. <laughs> so uh, any questions from members? And he can read music, yes. Uh, Senator Icorn, closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to present this. And, you know, this is obviously a very unique part of not only Minnesota's history, but the nation's history to have the only remaining state band in the United States still operating in Minnesota is a really cool thing. And I think when folks passed the Legacy Amendment, I think this is the kind of project they had envisioned uh, when they went to vote for this. So I'm, I'm happy we're able to have it here today and, and hopeful for its inclusion, not only for Senator Lang, but for myself. This is a really, really unique project. So with that, Mr. Chair, I hope we can lay this over for possible inclusion. Yes, and we will. We will lay Senate file 1170 for possible inclusion in the Legacy Omnibus Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for, Thank you very much. for your testimony. Okay, we, members, we're moving along. Um, almost done now. Uh, and uh, we've been hearing uh, so, such a variety uh, proposal for uh, arts and culture funding requests. And the next one is Senator Kunish, uh, 775. Senate, Senate file 775, Appetite for Change for Community, community Cooks. Another interesting one. Um, you may go ahead anytime, Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a really fun one. This is a really exciting one. I'm, I'm excited to carry this bill. As soon as I heard about it, I was like, yeah, I want to I wanna advocate for you. So um, this bill is an appropriation for a, a program uh, in, uh, called Appetite for Change. Um, uh, I think we all know that Food is a key ingredient in nourishing our well-being. Um, it's not just our bodies, but when we're eating fresh, non-processed, locally grown, nourishing food, it sustains our body and our minds and our souls and our imagination and our well-being. And uh, this program does just that. Our cultures, and we talk a lot uh, about cultures, uh, is so completely connected to food and expanding the legacy, uh, the legacy funding to support culinary arts and food culture preservation is exciting and opens new doors for connecting the diverse cultures represented in our state. COVID and scheduling issues have prevented our members from taking, have t t prevented their have prevented members from taking a field trip to this um, to our uh, this organization and doing their hands-on cooking workshops together. Uh, experience deep cross-cultural connections that come from sharing our heritage through family recipes. However, um, we um, we all have an invitation to visit this establishment, um, and I hope that we can make it out there this year. Uh, it's just very close. Uh, this 501c3 is located in North Minneapolis. We're requesting um, uh, 2500, $2, uh, $250,000 in this fiscal year 24 um, for this Art and Cultural Heritage Fund to, um, uh, to sustain this program and um, build it out so that all of us can appreciate the the heritage of foods. And so with that, um, I have the Community Cooks Program Manager, Nicole Powell, to testify. Uh, Ms. Powell, welcome. Uh, please state your name for the record. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Nicole Powell, N-I-C-O-L-E-P-O-W-E-L-L. -L. You may go ahead. Um, Community Cooks is a program that was brought together um, back in 2010 with the three co-founders. We had found out that in the community that we were missing something. That was bringing families back to the table. 
um, we had a few flagship programs. And with this one, the participants enjoy getting back in the kitchen with that connection to food. Um, it was something that was missing and something that everyone was excited about. Years later, it's been a power powerhouse for this program in our community. Uh, families are looking forward to learning new recipes, finding new ways to connect with their families. With that being lost, they come and join us at Community Cooks to figure out new recipes and try new healthy options to share with their families. Um, Appetite for Change's mission is to use food as a tool to build health, wealth, and social change within a community. Um, I am a, a proof of their um, hard work in the community by starting off as a participant and um, joining their um, organizations. Um, the, the funding will help us continue with our Community Cooks program, which was paused due to COVID, and we had to make a pivot to our Community Cook Meal Box, which was a safer turn for the community members. Now in 23, we are trying to get this back into the facility for the families and community members to come back and start cooking. Our virtual program will also use um, to stay in connection with um, families such as our new moms who weren't able to come in and be in the same space. With this funding, we are um, continuing to host workshops and meet our community members, such as our elders and young people, to use that community, that cultural connection with funding. They will be able to share stories, their heritage with food, and connection with food. Um, by uh, having your support, we'll also be able to start a podcast, which we'll be able to carry along this conversation, the storytelling around food, while learning more about our community members in North Minneapolis. Thank you very much, Ms. Powell. Um, any question from members? <laughs> Senator McHugh? Yes. Senator McHugh? <laughs> Senator McHugh, I'm like, I'm ready. Let's go. Why don't we do a tour? Can we, go? can we just come? <laughs> <laughs> Bring food over or go? Go there. Go there. Yeah. All right, let's quickly wrap this up and go. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Well, any closing remarks, Senator, uh, Senator Kunish? <laughs> well, um, uh, members, I hope that uh, we look at this as a real investment in our communities, um, our unique communities. I know, um, you know, just from my own life experience, those those recipes that our ancestors carried. My my grandma was Scotch, but she was married to a Czech, and so the food that she would make, you know, had these unique combinations. And uh, I don't know about you, but during COVID, a lot of us started cooking again. We started baking and preparing foods again. And with that came the stories of um, families. And we started sharing recipes, not just within our family, but within our communities. And this is a real opportunity for, um, for us to really invest in those neighborhoods. I mean, as, um, as Nicole was saying, the, you know, this isn't just for for going in and, and learning how to cook and make something fun and take it home and show your family, but this is young mothers. This is bringing young folks together with elders. This is being, bringing different community members into um, a shared space where they can share their recipes, their spices, you know, the way they prepare their food that might be a little bit different from us. And it certainly is a if you can think of almost any other healthy way, unless you're outside doing it, uh, healthier way to connect with your community. So I hope that um, this modest request is is one of those that goes on the list. And thank you, Senator Kunish, for bringing this forward. And so now we will lay Senate File 775 for possible inclusion in our legacy animus bill. Thank you. Uh, next Great one. Thank you, Ms. Power. And next one is... Um, Senate file 1912, public educational radio station. Anytime oh. you're ready. I was still thinking about putting together a field trip. <laughs> 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 All right. There we go. Seems like Mr. Glazer's been here before, knows all the tricks to the trade in he over here. Um, so members, I have here for you Senate File 1912. 
This is um, uh, um, a bill that I'm asking for your support of $3.9 million in legacy funding for Ampers and its stations. Uh, this is the same amount that they've received in the past by M Biennium, so it's not an increase. Ampers represents 18 independent community radio stations. I have uh, four in my own district. Uh, and in the interest of, of saying much more, I'm just going to turn it over to Joel Glazer. He is the president and CEO of Ampers, and he's going to give you a, a quick introduction. Welcome, Ms. Gla Mr. Glazer. Uh, please state your name for the record. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, uh, Chair Her Members, for the record, my name is Joel Glazer, and I am the president and CEO of Ampers, the Association of Minnesota Public Educational Radio Stations. Ampers is an association that represents and supports 18 independent, publicly licensed, hyper-local community radio stations. 17 of the 18 are eligible for and receive state funds. The stations are licensed to native tribes, a community itself, or a college, school, or university. We are not affiliated with Minnesota Public Radio, Twin Cities Public Television, or Minnesota Public Television Association. We primarily serve underserved communities, we define underserved as BIPOC, new immigrants, those living with a disability, and those living in greater Minnesota. In fact, 14 of our 18 stations are in greater Minnesota. As Senator Kundish mentioned, we're requesting 3.9 million, the same amount we received in the last biennium. Before I talk about that request, I wanna take just a moment to tell you a couple of brief highlights from our FY22 programming. We created nearly 29,000 hours of radio programming. To put that in perspective, there are less than 9,000 hours in a year. So that's more than three years of round the clock programming. But keep in mind, we have 17 different radio stations creating that content. To create all that content, we paid more than 500 Minnesotan artists for their work. Those artists range from up and coming musicians to established singers, photographers, writers, and more. We had programs across the state from as far north as Grand Marais, Boys Fort, and Thief River to as far south as Winona and Mankato. We hired more than 180 contractors. That included community members and educators, like Native American elders to help with language and history preservation. The, hun the funds helped support 17 FTEs across the state, resulting in more than 2,500 radio segments. We now have more than 26,000 segments housed on our Ampers website. Many of those segments are award-winning. In FY22, Ampers and its member stations received six awards from the Minnesota Society of Professional Journalists and one from the Midwest Broadcast Journalists Association. But to get a better feel for the programming, I had my production team put together this very brief video. Today we're going to learn the Ojibwe word for summer. Mibin. Mibin. 1944, Virginia May Hope in Winnebago, Minnesota, had nerves of steel. She was a wasp. So it is June, and oftentimes when June comes around, folks start to think towards summer, they start to think towards all of these different things, but there's also Juneteenth. James Garrett Jr. is an architect. During his childhood in St. Paul, James fell in love with buildings. Today, he builds these buildings. We as Native people, as we are rediscovering our language, our culture, our values, not only are we going to have the grow the capacity for us to take care of ourselves and heal ourselves, but those lessons, those are the same lessons that are going to heal this world. But even that does not capture the true depth of the diversity of our programming. We've been producing diverse programming by and for underserved communities since long before BIPOC was ever an acronym. Just take a look at your screen. Diversity is in our name, Diverse Radio for Minnesota Communities. That brings us to our request. We are asking to receive the same amount we received in the last biennium. Let me be very, very clear. We'd love to have more money. There are tons of additional diverse programs we can do. But we work within and serve those diverse underserved communities, and we see the needs and the requests coming from those communities. 
Now, should this committee decide to increase our funding anyway, which has happened in past bienniums, we aren't gonna argue, and let me assure you, the funds will go to good use, but we are also okay staying flat from the previous biennium. With that, Chair Her, members, I appreciate your support of Senate File 1912, and I'm available if there are any questions. Any questions from members? Well, thank you for the work, uh, good work that you do, Mr. Glaser. You know, I just have a thought, you know, on radio, you know, how that technology transit uh, as a mass media tool uh, trans transits throughout time, where we have, you know, from the court, from the court phone, dial phone to phoneless phone, we still use that technology, you know, back to the day Orson Well till today, these days we still use radio as a form of communication in competing with social media, in competition with social media. So, you know, and thank you for the work that you do to, to educate um, all variety of people that we have in our state in their own language as well. So, um, that's all I got to say. And any um, closing remarks, Senator Kunish? Yeah, um, yes, I just, you know, I want to also um, remind everyone that during COVID times when uh, it was imperative that we got information out about um, the pandemic and where to find vaccinations and how to keep yourself your, and your family and your communities healthy and happy, um, Ampers reached almost everyone in, in, in Minnesota with the message of how to take care of themselves best. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is more than just a, a, you know, a, a radio station for enjoyment, but this is definitely a, a connector. So I would uh, hope that you would uh, um, also recognize this, this ask. Um, it's not more than it was before and included in your omnibus bill. Thank you. Okay. With that, we will lay Senate File 1912 for possible inclusion in our legacy omnibus bill. Thank you both. And next is uh, Senate File 2426, Senator Kunish, uh, Minnesota Museum of the Arts. Okay. And uh, Senator Kunish, let me ask a question. There's an amendment to this yeah. bill. Okay. So uh, you may go ahead and motion the amendment um, sure. to the shape that you like. So, um, Mr. Chair and members, this is um, Senate File 2426, and with that I have an A1, A1 amendment, and it's basically just cleaning up the language and making sure that, um, that um, all the, um, the language is in the right form, put it in the right way for this bill. Okay, all in, all, all for, the A1 amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay? Okay. Motion prevail. Okay, uh, Senator Kunish, uh, to the bill as amended. Sure. So this is another bill that I'm very, very excited about. Um, there is a small museum. I don't know how many of you have visited the um, M Museum, downtown St. Paul. Um, it, uh, it, uh, this museum is unique in that it, it seeks to explore American identities and experiences through the uh, power of art and creativity. It's located in the upper Midwest here in Minnesota, and it is the heart of a diverse city, that being St. Paul. So, um, in recent years, the M has embraced a collaborative curatorial model, and this model is rooted in creating ex uh, creative exchanges with Minnesota, which is Minnesota. It's based, with, um, based in artists, cultural bearers and communities who have been historically and are presently excluded from many American art museums. This model was developed with community partners. It prioritizes mutual trust and respect with the intention of creating long-lasting and dynamic relationships. Uh, this museum, the M, uh, has uh, the longest held partnerships with the St. Paul Public Schools spanning more than 30 years. And its most recent partners include Art uh, from Inside, Grupo Soap del Corazon, um, the Halle Q. Brown Community Center, the African American Interpretive Center of Minnesota, the Southeast Asian Diaspora Project, MISNA, and Emerging Curators um, uh, Institute. 
Uh, and so I do have a couple of um, testifiers here. First, I would like um, to introduce Executive Director Dr. Kate Bean. She is one of the fir first Native American Executive Directors of an American art museum in the country and has been continuously recognized as a significant change maker in the Twin Cities, particularly now in her position, uh, position at the M. So um, with that, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Kate Bean. Dr. Bean, welcome. Um, Hamitake Epi, hello, my legislative relatives. Uh, in Dakota, my name is Ahadipiwi, brings them home woman. And in English, my name is Dr. Kate Bean. <laughs> and I'm happy to see you all here today. I'm a citizen of the Flandreau Santi Sioux, Dakota, but my family is from here. I come from the villages here in Minnesota. I'm one of the first Native American executive directors of American Art Museum, as Senator Kunish mentioned. Um, and uh, our, our museum, the M, is located in the heart of downtown St. Paul in the historic Pioneer Endicott building on Robert Street. The M is St. Paul's only art museum and is free to all. Uh, Native leadership serving all and being a revitalizing cultural force in downtown St. Paul are just two of the things that make us distinct from other museums in the state. We foster and support collaborative storytelling through art and creativity that makes a difference in our communities by building recognition, understanding, and relationships across different lived experiences, including rural and urban, indigenous and immigrant, young and old. This storytelling is powerful and widely resonant because we work with artists and communities to co-create ex exhibitions, public art projects, and community-centered programming. We are the only museum in the state that makes supporting, exhibiting, and collecting artists and culture bearers um, from Minnesota our driving purpose with a focus on artists, cultures, and communities that have been and continue to be underserved by art museums. Recognizing the power and significance of building long-term relationships with Native American and indigenous makers, creators, and leaders is central to shaping the M's next chapter. We have founded a Native Arts Partnership Council this goal, uh, the goal of this council, for, the goal for indigenous values such as being a good relative and ally, the very meaning of the word Dakota, to be a foundation of the M's intersectional work with all communities. At the M, artists, culture bearers, and community members from across Minnesota from wide-ranging backgrounds that represent the rich diversity of this place, from students to elders, have found a place to share their stories and connect with others through the beauty and power of art, often for the first time. An artist who has been working to empower mothers and reclaim the indigenous African sensibilities of her ancestors since the 1980s is featured in the M's current street facing exhibition and is exhibiting at a museum for the very first time. She is in her 70s. Our street facing exhibitions and Skyway murals are accessible to all and I hope you've all enjoyed them and don't even require stepping inside to experience them. We are on the threshold of a historically significant moment in the organizational's history. Thanks in part to 10.5 million in bonding funds uh, of a larger $14 million project um, to expand out our facility uh, which will, and complete our facility, which will restore a, a historically significant building. Construction starts next week. We're very excited by that. Um, this will triple the M's gallery space and enable us to share the M's collection of 5,000 works of art, many of which are by important Minnesota artists with roots dating back to the 1890s. The M is bridging the past and present to create a more vibrant future for the diverse communities of this place, making downtown St. Paul a more beautiful, vibrant, and meaningful place to live, work, and visit along the way to support our work uh, in phase reopening this fall, we are sinking one and a half million dollars for operating and programming support. Uh, in your packets, we have provided more information about the M and our vision along with the list of upcoming programming for the next two years as we rebuild capacity post-COVID and settle into our new expanded space. Working in partnership with community requires flexibility and capacity. The examples provided are just a sampling of what we have planned. Pidamayaye, uh, and I would like to, to um, invite my, my wonderful friend here, uh, Javier Tavera, who is a phenomenal photographer and artist that we work with often. Mr. Tavera, welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Senate Committee. 
my name is Javier Tavera. I am an artist who has been living and working in Minnesota since 1996. My work is multifaceted, but often explore issues related to Latinx identity and immigrant culture, drawing from a foundation of knowledge from my own life. I have exhibited uh, widely, national, nationally, internationally, and have a breadth of experience with museums that give me the insight to speak to what makes the Minnesota Museum of American Art so special and important. I have a long relationship with the Minnesota Museum of American Art, specifically in 2006 with the exhibition Only Human, and 2014 with the exhibition From Here to There. But most recently, I collaborated with the M staff to organize street-facing group exhibition about the complexity of mestizaje, a colonizing term that means to be both of indigenous and Spanish ancestry. I truly believe that the M is at the forefront of museum evolution towards a more inclusive environment where we can express through art complex histories and ideas. It takes individual and institutional courage to take on topics like those we explored in Mestizaje. It takes integrity, devotion to culture, art, and community. It takes bravery to truly collaborate with an art collective with an art collective and change the narrative of what people think a museum is. Next year, we will collaborate with the M to present a retrospective exhibition exploring the impact of Grupo Sub del Corazón, 23-year-old collective in Minnesota, which fund, was founded by fellow artist Doggy Padilla in 2000. A strong, well-supported M helps to ensure that artists of this region, whether they are first peoples, were born here or came here from somewhere else, have a place to be seen, heard, and supported, a place that they can shape, help shape through the wisdom of their life experiences and beauty of their creative visions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, question, members? OK, uh, Sarah Kunish, uh, closing remark. Well, once again, I would ask you um, for your support of this bill. We heard one, we just heard a bill that feeds our body and, and mind. This is one that will um, feed, feed our creativity, um, build again that community and understanding of each other. And so um, I, would, I would hope that you would also support this in your omnibus bill, um, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And we will lay over uh, Senate File 2126 for possible inclusion in our Omnibus Legacy Bill. Next will be uh, my bill. I'd like to pass the gavel to my Vice Chair, Sam McEwen. Welcome, Senator Herr. Uh, My pleasure. Would you like to go in the order that we have the bills on our list yes. for today? Yes. First, we have Senate File 641. Yep, 641. To your bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members, for being patient and uh, stay with us through this time. But more importantly, I want uh, to thank uh, to thanks to my testifiers for uh, staying mostly throughout the throughout this hearing, and I see them, you know, very early. Some of them at the beginning of the the, the committee hearing. So appreciate their patience as well. So thirty thousand feet, uh, Senate File six forty one, um, we uh, is is uh, appropriating uh, one hundred fifty thousand for one time funding. Uh, to an organization called 30,000 Feet, which is located in Eastside St. Paul, a nonprofit uh, that advanced the economic success of African American youth through culturally responsive arts and uh, technology education, uh, social emotional le learning, and African American history and culture. Uh, I have here Ms. Vanessa y Young that will talk more about the organization and their, what their plan are in terms of uh, the, the funding. Very good. Thank After you. you. 
Thank you, um, Madam Chair and Senator Herr, for uh, allowing this time and space for our hearing. Again, my name is Vanessa Young from 30,000 Feet. I'm the Director of Programs. And at 30,000 Feet, we use arts to increase academic achievement, build community relationships, and to invest high-level programming in art residencies for youth who wish to enter the art field from disenfranchised backgrounds. We help redirect student despair and trauma experienced by encouraging artistic expression to build community and empathy amongst one another. Youth work with professionals to create art that inspires change. To ensure this program is accessible, we provide transportation and have offered over 40 hybrid online and in-person art residencies from DJing, singing, songwriting, um, writing children's stories, spoken word, murals, and, and many more. I won't keep going on and on, but we like to offer all of the arts um, that the young people would like to explore. We've served over 2,000 youth from now, um, excuse me, from low-income communities since the start of our art residency program in 2018 through a collaborative approach with various Twin City schools, libraries, community spaces, and now at our very own Art Center on Arcade, which happens to be within a five-mile radius of over 20 schools, rec centers, libraries, and other youth-driven entities which really positions us to be another premier field trip destination to inspire change and improvements for us all using art as a vehicle. And at that, I'll yield. Thank for you very questions. much for your testimony. Uh, members, any questions or discussion for Senator Herr or his testifier? Okay, seeing none, uh, any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with, Senator? Well, um, number one is I want to stay under, under time, and I think we did very well. And, yes. But uh, most importantly, I really appreciate 30,000 feet. Once was in my district, mm -hmm. but now technically is outside my district by about, <laughs> about a block or so. <laughs> but they're doing good work serving the east side, and uh, they work with all youth. But uh, the, the target community is African-American youth that, you know, empower their identity, you know, education, and uh, this, can, this, this will en enhance the uh, disparity gap in terms of education, uh, family, well-being, and so forth. So I really commend the work that Ms. Vanessa Young and her staff is doing. Uh, excellent. It, it's beyond my, my description of the compassion, the, the um, energy they poured into making our, our community a better place. Thank you, Senator. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful work. Um, Senate file 641 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we have Senate file 2777. Senator, uh, whenever you're ready. Yep. Madam, Madam Chair, Senate File uh, 277. Oh, it's a good good label of <laughs> bills here. Um, uh, it's asking for uh, 9,000 fiscal year 2024 and uh, 9,000 also for 2025 from Arts and Culture Heritage Fund uh, to Minnesota Humanities Center for grant to St. Kam Lao to create culture arts project and preserve traditional performance. And I'll let uh, Mr. Apachat uh, sing Hong Kong here uh, to explain more of the program that he's doing. Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair and the committee member. And thank you, Senator Her, for carrying this bill out. And also uh, the co-author, Senator Hopman, Senator Pa and Senator Shong. <laughs> oh, one more is um, the committee administrator, Kara Josephson. Thank you for placing this bill on the agenda. So my name is Abhishek Krai Singh, and I am the president of the Sien Khet Lao Minnesota organization. So Sien Khet Lao uh, start with a group of young Lao people who were refugee and immigrant to the U.S. after the um, Vietnam War. The group was initiated in uh, 2016, and on the 2018, 
we became legally recognized as the 501c3 non-profit organization located in Brooklyn Park. So, on a mission that um, we want to be a uh, accessible community hub that provide the tr uh, traditional dance workshop, language learning, storytelling, cultural exchange, and knowledge sharing for um, the Southeast Asian community. In developing our mission, we want to ensure that we not only connect with our heritage, but also we inspire ourselves and others to think bigger and go beyond the pre, uh, preservation of our culture and heritage. We use um, cultural event, event uh, traditional performance to engage with our community and others to understand of who we are and why we value our culture. So presently, uh, Sieng Can Lao is one of the few non-profit organizations that representing the Lao community. And since our inception in uh, 2016, the organization has become one of the most well-known non-profit organizations within the Lao uh, community. We engage with elder children, youth that are allowing us to leverage and, uh, a larger portion of the Lao community. This bill is designed to support the art culture heritage of the Lao people and will allow us as a nonprofit agency to engage with the community member and also build a community relation in a productive and meaningful way. In passing this bill, you are not only empower this community to honor their tradition of art and culture, but to pass it on, to share it, and to give it new life here in Minnesota for generations to come. This is what we are trying to accomplish at the Sien Can Lao. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for your testimony. Members, are there any questions or any discussion about Senate File 2777? Okay, very good. Seeing none, uh, Senator Hurd, do you have any last thought that you'd like to leave with us? Um, I'm just amazed at the uh, work that uh, Sin Kam Lao is doing, you know, with, with the young people and teaching the, the intricate arts of dancing. Um, my, my, my cultural identity is Hmong, but I from, come from the country of Laos. And both Hmong and Lao are, are neighbor of, of people of each other out of the country of Laos. And we, I'm always very amazed of the intricacy of the dance. You might see uh, similar to Indian dance, but not, not quite, uh, um, uh, let's say, not quite in the speed, but slowly and uh, with, with the gesture and the curving of arm and finger that I only see unique in, in that area or uniquely in the world. And so uh, maybe at some point uh, down the road, perhaps, you know, we could ask uh, Mr. Singh Kham to bring a performance that could uh, show us, you know, as if you, um, you might be familiar to in, in the old classic of Anna and the King, something like that, that will be some of the dance that... Uh, uh, Sing Kam Lao is teaching uh, the, the children. Although, just want to let you know that the Anna and the King is banned from, the, from, from, the, the, from viewing in this, the country of Thailand for, for I, I, I would say, for um, misrepresentation of some, to some degree. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, I just want to put that in relation so folks know the intricacy of the curving of the finger, the arms, is, is very unique. And so I um, really pre appreciate uh, Sing Kam Lao for uh, maintaining the arts and still teaching to young people to stay here in the state of Minnesota. So I ask for your support of this bill, Senate 5277.
Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for your presentation. You. Sounds wonderful. Uh, Senate File 2777 is laid over for, for possible inclusion in the Legacy Omnibus Bill. Senator Hur, you have one yes. remaining bill. Yep, uh, this bill is not identifiable yet in number, but it's been jacketed, you know, and uh, as we know, um, there's, there's uh, been a uh, volume of uh, bills going through the advisor, so it has not come out. But I thought, you know, I want to preempt and give a little hearing uh, to this bill. And thank you for uh, the requester for being very patient and, and staying with us, being the last person here. Um, Mr. Bang, why don't you come up here? Uh, this, this is a, a grant appropriation of 50000 uh, total of 100000 about 50000 uh, for fiscal year 2024, to, and then 50000 for year 2025. Um, a grant for Sikh Pak Tak Krok of USA to work with youth after school programs and community to teach them cultural game of Tulu and Sikh Pak Tak Krok. Um, I will let uh, maybe, I'll, I'll let Mr. Yvang here explain the difference between Tulu and Sikh Pak Tak Krok. Um, earlier this, <laughs> earlier this, uh, the session I brought uh, the Sipak Takra USA gold winner to the Senate chamber for us so for have opportunities. It's a world class medal trophy that they took they, they received from uh, in, in competition in South Korea this year. So um, Mr. Van can talk a little bit about it and I'll look forward to the conclusion of this. Well session. thank you, Senator Ho. Thank you, Madam Chair and member of the committee. My name is Tian Eng Va. Uh, I'm the current chair of the uh, SIPA Takrop. It's a formerly incorporated 501c3 nonprofit here in Minnesota. Uh, I was speaking mostly uh, from uh, the SIPA Takrop organization, but I was speaking on behalf of the uh, sport of Tulu, or uh, in English, top spinning. Uh, I brought all the product, but I think you guys sat all day, and uh, with that, I would be, I guess, uh, ask you to point my uh, short and brief tes uh, testimony just so everybody could get a better rest and get ready for the weekend. So again, my name is Tian Neng Wa. I'm the chair of Sipa Takra, the organization. I myself have lived in Minnesota for the last 38 years. And since 1995, I've been teaching in organizational setting, K-12 colleges, uh, community uh, programming in my native language of Hmong, and in that I also uh, took part in being active of promoting, you know, newcomers funding games so that we could incorporate it into mainstream. One specific work started with uh, Boss Lago, the former Minnesota Thunder soccer team coach. He saw that many of the, especially St. Paul and Minneapolis, many of the baseball diamond were on use. So he, he started an initiative back in 1994 with the Minnesota Thunder Youth Organization established under his leadership to turn the diamond into uh, usable uh, cultural games. And that's when I got interested and started uh, advocating and promoting uh, some of my cultural game. And those, the two dominant one being the Sipatakra and the Taspin, the Tulu. And also, I was uh, fortunate to have the then citizen or uh, public radio producer, um, Mr. Her here, and now the, our senator, to uh, be part of those uh, um, initiatives along the way. So with that, we are requesting the state funds to help us develop, basically, this is from uh, scratch, to develop the two sports in the language that could be appropriate for the age, uh, and gender, and especially ability or accessible to all ability of playing, and that it's age appropriate that we could teach to uh, K-12 setting as well as the adult. As many of us know, uh, most of the sports or any athletic programming usually started or initiated and developed by men, and we sometimes forget that there are other people who have perhaps less strength and less ability than we do, and we forget that they also need to be, I mean, 
they also enjoy playing uh, in such sporting, uh, you know, programming, whether it be recreational or, or further more and more professionally. So we just want to uh, ask uh, those the stated amount to help us develop in the language and in the format that is appropriate for everybody. Uh, is in particular the Zipatakra. Now that the international uh, uh, playing uh, field is really looking uh, at the. U.S. to help lead them to hopefully one day soon to uh, get the number of country in the number of continent that play the sport so they could apply for their place at the Summer Olympic. And if that ever happened, we will be the center of that sport here in uh, the U.S. And we want to start the very basic now so we have the right coaching, the right referee, and the right rule and regulation to help our youngster prepare for the future. So I thank you all uh, for staying this late and hearing my story and my testimony. So thank you so much. I welcome any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Yes, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm looking, I was looking it up and I see uh, pictures of you playing uh, on the Star Tribune. Are you, are you good at these sports? Are you, you, are you, you yeah. The uh, neither. <laughs> <laughs> good I'm almost a nerd in my younger days, uh, but I, I was a I was a decent wrestler, a great Greco wrestler, but I um, I'm not as agile. Um, I did uh, you probably see that article because I had to you know initiate uh, kick off the celebration. So one of them is a top spin. Top spin is the uh, is is uh, five thousand years uh, of game in my culture. Uh, you, you, you put one spin top and, and front and the, red, the, the competitor team trying to strike that, that top spin. So the other sport is like Mr. Vang here just mentioned, um, is uh, foot volleyball. Uh, so uh, you can play, play with any part of your body except your hand can use your head to bump. It's a similar rule to volleyball. You know, there are two, three on each team. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the world champion, as of now, live in our state. And so um, you know, they pick up gold medals. Just recently from South Korea is, 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 uh, is continental, I think most, the, South, the Southeast Asian region, right? And then yeah. also Middle Eastern is part and, of it. And Europe too. And Europe too. Uh, part of that uh, network, and then America join in, but the American team are predominantly folks are from here, from Southeast Asian uh, heritage, and so they want to turn that into um, um, Olympic registry one of these days. So um, that, is, that is the description of the two games that Mr. Vang here, who has exper expertise in working with young people, um, summer school program, after school program, would like to do, and uh, we re re request for small dollars mm -hmm. to help us start with that. So I ask for your support of this this bill that uh, uh, soon to be uh, jacketed, um, and and uh, we'll ask for a layover in the omnibus bill. Thank you very much, Senator Hur, and thank you for your testimony, sir. The, um, it sounds like we have a whole series of fantastic field trips that we could just do for the end of session with this committee. So that I would love to see these games being played. Um, thank you. Yes, and, and Senator Hur. One more thing. I, I like, since uh, Senator Wiesenberg asked a question, I would invite him to my district uh, one of these days, and we can, we can play. I can teach you how to play, even though I'm not that good. Uh, Senator Root, my predecessor, uh, helped uh, put a little funding to build the court in my district. That's how it all started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, member. It's very good. Uh, this Senate file will be laid over for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. Well, member, I appreciate your patience and uh, how many hours to be uh, run this marathon, <laughs> like a sea marathon. It's pretty good. It's four, it's four minutes to eight, so we're pretty okay. much on time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, all for your, thank you all for your patience, and you know, we'll put the project together in an honorable bill in a meaningful way. I appreciate all your input. You know, 
engagement discussion. Um, I just want to reassure that the bill you heard um, and when it passed, it doesn't mean like people are just going to go pick the dollars off from a bank account. It's still going to go to, the funding will go to uh, Department of Administration or um, uh, the Humanity Center where they will, um, they will um, some, vet this and monitor this closely. Uh, so it's, and also, there's also an audit, audit process that come afterward, too. So just want to reassure a member of this process that we have in our state. Uh, so thank you for your time. And any, any other information from members? We are meeting in the morning, right? In just a few short hours. Yes, we are. Uh, Cara, any update? Oh, no, just uh, everything's been posted uh, online. So see you in about 12 hours. No. <laughs> okay, so then uh, meeting is adjourned.